tonight we are having a work, se work session on hopefully uh, further moving along the camping ordinance. Thank you, Gordon. I was not on mic. I apologize. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, tonight, we're starting with a work session here for the council to uh, move along or maybe even wrap up this evening the um, situation around a, a camping ordinance here in the city of Canby. And I believe we've got, Scott, are you presenting that or is that on Mr. Mr. Lindsay? You're up, sir. And Chief Tro. Well, yeah. Come on up, Chief. Yeah, You're here. Good evening, gentlemen. Hey, good evening. Again, it's only been two weeks. <laughs> no, I and I appreciate, I know that we had put some urgency on this, and I appreciate yeah. the two of you putting your heads together and coming back so quickly to move this along. So hopefully well, we'll, the, we'll get some good dialogue so, on this. So you'll see in Exhibit A that we put in the packet, um, what we propose in terms of a camping ordinance that we think we think is probably as about as strict as you could be before you fall outside of the reasonable category, um, and part of this is the way in which it kind of marries itself with some other uh, existing laws um, in terms of parking and towing. Um, what what I will say is. Um, I also added in the packet, I had mentioned some of the Oregon revised statutes that we currently use um, for situations where, where uh, the police run into folks uh, under, under circumstances you know, similar to this, where oftentimes uh, th these circumstances also give birth to you know, the breaking of other statutes. All of those statutes that I have in the packet are, have been upheld as constitutional, and they're crimes, right? What, what's interesting about this is, um, these, this is, we're talking about a violation, right? Because the Boise case taught us that um, the, the homelessness and houselessness and the idea of sleeping in public uh, is cruel and unusual, unusual to punish it, so you have to allow it to a certain degree. And then in, as far as your time, space, and manner, regulations of the sleeping in public have to be reasonable as to scope. Um, and uh, they also cannot basically look to punish or to make it so hard to do that, that it can't be done in your town. So you can't completely eliminate the behaviors. And again, th we're talking about for camping ordinance, it really is just would be a violation. Um, and so the reason I put those other uh, tools in, in there is because those are constitutional and they're crimes, which in Oregon, you can never ever be arrested on a violation. You can be arrested on a crime. So if, if police are always out and about looking for somebody who is breaking uh, law in a criminal way, uh, then they can actually make an arrest and you have kind of a whole different scenario. So. Uh, and, and I think that's an important distinction too because the distance sometimes between thinking, well, we have to be humane and nice in and, uh, and, and terms of folks who are experiencing houselessness, but if they are in otherwise engaged in criminal behavior, then they can still be subject to arrest under all sorts of crimes, but these, the ones that I put in the packet are the ones that are kind of the usual suspects. So uh, I want to be pretty clear about that because it isn't like this is a throwing up, having, having a camping ordinance isn't a throwing up of like, people can do anything because they, they can't do anything. And in fact, if you look at some of those statutes, you know, it's, it's maybe some people think this is severe, but offensive littering is a crime. You could be subject to arrest and taken to jail for that. So um, we, we're not saying, you know, let anything happen in town. We are simply saying there's a case out there and then there's subsequent Oregon law that's telling us that we can't be cruel and unusual in the way we treat sleeping. And, and then subsequently through Grant's past case, kind of the, the uh, accoutrement of, of sleeping, which is sleeping bags and tents and things like that. So um, that's where we're at and that's why those things are, are existing. So uh, the, the, the nitty gritty of this for the purposes of us getting still insight from you guys 
and feedback is um, we've, we've currently put the time in here as, and th this is on par with several uh, other municipalities, um, that the hours of 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. is when you're not supposed to be sleeping or camping, right? So in the, in the daytime. So we're comfortable proposing to you guys that if people are gonna sleep, most people sleep at night and that if it just so happens that you want to try to take advantage of some public land, that it's reasonable to say that it should happen at night. So, and I don't know if you guys want to stop there and talk about whether 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. seems reasonable to you or not. Yeah, if that's okay with you, with both of you, if, as we kind of take these yeah, points yeah. that you need well, clarification yeah, I, on. We're trying to get feedback. Yeah, yeah. I, then I would rather we do that piece by piece and okay. wait till the end and, and lose out on something. So yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, Councilor Davis, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. And um, Joe, what has been changed? I mean, you, we're hearing the same thing over again from last time. You haven't changed anything from last time so far. Well, so what has been changed from the last time we talked about this? Okay, we, we put in cemeteries to go with the city parks. Okay. Um, we took out the parking lot, the idea of public parking lots. Um, we, I put in the, within the residential um, property that any street that borders any residential zone is also considered residential for the purposes of any type of camping. Okay. So that looks, if, when you have a street that is abutting the residential zoning, let's right. say it abuts, you know, commercial Pine zoning. Street. That yeah, that street then for the purposes of the the disallowance of camping in any residential zone, that other side of the street is also considered the residential. Okay. Okay. Um, the I I added least um, property as well because we do actually lease some property so uh, the idea is we have real property but we also lease some property as the city and so we would we would make that also um, subject to the rules so that it can be enforced on all um, our ground lease at the uh, adult center and, and pool mm -hmm. for instance um, we uh, added this idea of vehicular um, street camping so We've, we've basically said that any public street or alleyway or driveway, you're not supposed to be camping on at all if you're just in a tent, you know what I mean? Or if you're in mm -hmm. uh, on, on a sleeping bag, because that's just flat out dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. for, for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. so, so, and that's sub four here. Um, but then we're saying that if you are on a street, then there's a, a provision for vehicles, motorhomes, or camper trailers, as long as they're legally parked and they're not in a residential zone. Um, and then the idea of that is they have to be operable and, and they have to be moved at least one block or one street every 24 hours. Um, so that if there's a status different from just parking your car, which is allowable up to 72 hours in our town right now, um, if you're then sleeping in your car and using it as mm -hmm. your home, then that's, that circumstance can allow a police, if they're, if they're looking at this particular um, ordinance, to go up, say, I noticed you've been parked here, or mm -hmm. most likely people have complained you know, that, that you've been parked here. Uh, and so you have to be able to prove that you're, you know, your car is operable and that it can move, um, or you could be in violation of this, this ordinance, which would then be just a, a violation of a ticket. Um, and, and then in the confluence of that and the uh, ORS that allows for towing is basically the seven, still the 72 hour rule, which is even if you can give them a ticket, you have to wait two more days to see if they can get it moved before you can tow it off. So that's okay. the way that works. Um, but we, we thought it sounded important to this group that the vehicles are operable and that mm -hmm. they can be moved on their own and not and maybe pushed or whatever. Um, and then uh, 
The other thing is, just wanted to be super clear that vehicular street camping still is disallowed in residential areas, so we made sure and highlighted that. And then we, before it had some stuff about um, <coughs> storage of personal property, because some other jurisdictions have allowed, you know, when people have their property, then whether or not they could store it. And we're of the mind that it, your property needs to go with you when you are not supposed to be camped out sleeping for the, mm -hmm. you know, uh, times that camping and sleeping is allowed uh, on, on various areas within the city. Uh, it ends up primarily being, you know, no parks, no cemeteries, no residential areas, and no streets that abut residential areas. Um, so that's kind of the lay of the land uh, as, we, as we heard what you guys said and tried mm -hmm. to include that. In. So does that help? Yeah, that, that does help. Um, just a quick question. So if a tent is camped mm -hmm. 9 o'clock at night till 7 in the morning, they have to get up and move, correct? Mm -hmm. But if the vehicle's in this, they're given 72 hours. Yeah. About 24, right? Well, there's, no, there's that's where the confusion is. Or they get a ticket. Okay, yeah. from seven o'clock, from from basically nine o'clock at night till seven in the morning, mm -hmm. somebody comes by and says you you have to move. Yeah, if they are camping in the vehicle. If they're so camping, camping in the vehicle, part of the vehicle, and then there's just the got it. It's separate. separate. Okay. okay, so then then they have to then they have to move. Yeah. Okay, um, so the person operating that vehicle has to have a license, I assume. If they drive it away, correct. They have to have a license and it has to be insured. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the vehicle has to be licensed. Or they would be subject to the other violations. To violations. Yeah. Right. Hence the legally parked. You can't mm -hmm. have a, yeah. a, a non-licensed vehicle parked on the road <coughs> anyway, right? Is that where the legally parked? Well, you don't, have to have a, you don't have to have a registration in order to park, but you do have it in order to move, right? So the, the problem is... So we allow t vehicles without well, proper tags can, on the road? Well, no, not necessarily. Here's the, here's kind of the issue, right? Is we allow, like if, if you wanted to start to have a fixer-upper and you put it in your parking lot in your house, you know, it doesn't have to have, it doesn't have to be registered with the DMV yet. You see what I'm saying? So there is, there are situations where cars exist legally speaking, where they, they don't have the proper registration because they're not, you know, the DMV, it, it well, right. doesn't maybe care I'm unless confused. you're using the streets of, of Oregon. I, maybe I'm confused about it because I always thought that in your case of the fixer-upper, mm -hmm. it that not properly tagged vehicle, if it doesn't have current tags on the license plate, then it couldn't be parked on the road. It had to be parked in your driveway. Is that not the case? It's a, it's a violation to have expired tags or non-registered vehicle on a public road. Yeah. Either, parked or moving. Park. Yeah. That's it's what I thought. Okay. Right. So therefore, yeah. if you're camping in a vehicle, it needs to have valid tags to be parked on the road. Well, right. you'll get two tickets. You see what I mean? You'll get, you'll get a ticket for not having your proper registration, and then you'll get a ticket for presumably unless you figure out a way to get it out of there. Because some people might not have a valid driver's <clears throat> license, but their buddy might, and they might call up their buddy and say, drive, or drive this out of here. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So, I mean, it, like, it isn't, those are all different <laughs> statuses, and they're all different violations, and they all are subject to, you know, whatever scenario that, because there's a million different scenarios mm -hmm. with all of these things, right? Right. If that's helpful. Sean, any question? Nope, it's already, already been asked. Oh, okay. The, uh, he's got his finger up. I know. Sorry. I'll okay. come back to him in a second. I got it. I, I have one too, but that's okay. <clears throat> Go first. Oh, thanks. Okay. <laughs> so back to the seven to nine question. Yeah. Um, that's right. Uh, clarify and lock that down. So I guess I'm looking into you, Chief, about... Because to because some of the mayors I've been talking with, that that piece has been like more like six o'clock in the morning. It does, I mean seven o'clock is I mean seven o'clock is fine. I and I because I know that the big piece out of the Boise aspect is that it's got to be consistent, and I shift and, changes and, and all that and, and, tend to be I think right around that four to six time frame anyways, and so. I mean, is that operationally for you guys? Is seven o'clock allow for that consistent piece to happen? Yes, I, I think that's fine. Okay. I mean, and, and really, it's 
what it's a reasonable time, right? So if you want at 6 a.m., I mean that's fine too. So I think either one would be fine. And again, if they're if they're still there, right, we can tell them to move along. And if they don't, it's a violation, right? So it's a it's a ticket. And Unless then, they're committing some other crime, then it's correct. Different. And you know that's what our officers use, right? If there's uh, some other crimes that they could use um, to enforce that, um, and. Then we do, so if they don't want to move, all right, we give them a ticket. It's that 72 hour notice that we're gonna, we have to give them 72 hours notice and post it, let them know before we take their camping equipment. And then if we take it after the 72 hours, that's when we have to keep it 30 days. Right, that's that's the the new rule that was, yeah. yeah. That's what the law is, yeah. yeah. So we have, to, we have to post notice in both English and Spanish on it, basically, before we remove it. Council Davis, Council President, and then Jason. Thanks. You guys have done a good job capturing a lot of the stuff we talked about, so thank you. The um, Just one addition that I was thinking about, too, it would be uh, if you could put in there public safety buildings uh, because of fire stations and police stations, potentially, um, because obviously firefighters coming in and out all hours of the night and emergency all equipment. That property, right? you're, you're yeah, that. yeah. So that's uh, brilliant. Thank you. Actually, for sure. I'm glad yeah. we're doing this. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And yeah, I was trying to bring it back to the time because that was kind of where we paused. Was at the the first line of the time frame. Yeah. Um, I, at six a.m., seven a.m. I that part isn't as worrisome to me as the other end. Are we married to nine o'clock? <clears throat> Excuse me, because I'm thinking about the summer months when it's still light out at nine o'clock and there's a lot of a lot of traversing of the rest of the community. I'm thinking maybe ten. Would be better, and so I was just wondering if there's a reason we picked nine. So let's speak to that end, to also, please. You, potentially, would it be seasonal too? Meaning, like when it's dark season at five, you know, for like the winter months, mm -hmm. would you want to say? Well, do we want to be seven a.m. to seasonal? seven p.m. and then in the summer, do you want to say? To 10 p.m. I don't know, Mr. City Attorney, and you tell. I mean, well, this that's all a case of first impression because the the law becomes operative in on July one. Right. And then uh, I know that there are organizations out there that would like to find some test cases to challenge. Yeah. Some laws. And, it, so, and in July, we're going right into the the stuff we have downtown, all the events. There's people out and about. At nine o'clock. So I guess so. the question becomes is if we are being <clears throat> seasonal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that well, you, does yeah. that create the gray to be a test case for some attorney to Well to the have idea come is reasonable, right? So we're supposed to have reasonable time, space, and manner. And if you have compelling reasons, um, then like it, you know, there's different levels of, of scrutiny in, in constitutional law. And so there's like rational basis, which is basically reasonable reasons. And then there's kind of intermediate, which is more uh, mm -hmm. serious reasons. And then there's strict scrutiny, which is like compelling reasons that are so narrowly tailored, right? Because it's super um, important. This itself, um, they, they seem to let it be rational basis in that because it, it's a cruel and unusual punishment problem. And so, uh, I mean, we're not supposed to be cruelly and unusually punishing okay. people, but we're not, I mean, what right now what we're trying to do is tailor what is reasonable in terms of, we have to have a city, we have to be able to, you know, you're giving reasons right now, uh, Councillor Hensley, about right what, why it would be the case that it would be okay to, to let people, you know, pitch a tent and sleep, at a you know at a reasonable hour if it's colder and it's in the winter and it's been dark for a few hours is it more reasonable to give them a little more time in the winter yeah and that's kind of what i was speaking to yeah for the this our my colleagues mm -hmm. here to discuss do yeah. we want to be stuck with seven to nine or do we want to do we want to talk about those hours about maybe moving them one way or the other seasonally or permanently I guess I'd just go back to the police chief and ask him what he thinks. Oh, well, yeah, anyway, yeah. I mean, it's, it's easier for it to be consistent, you know, we know from whatever, you know, all year long, it's from whatever, 9 a.m., 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. or whatever that is. Right. Now, I can definitely see your point about, you know, summer people are out more, they're late, and 
Yeah, and I can see the point about being consistent. So, and I mean, we need to allow at least eight hours for restful sleep. So, mm -hmm. and this is a 10 hour window. Maybe we make it seven to 10 year round. Just a thought. I'm throwing it out there from my colleagues. input. I mean, it, it is, if that seems reasonable to the panel, right? And because honestly, I, I think the task of every city is to try to figure out literally what is reasonable. What is reasonable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are our quiet hours, our legal quiet hours in the city? Ten. Do we have a... It depends on the zone and it depends on the type of noise. So what is our earliest? Um, I I think it's 7 to 10. I think. It's 10. I think normally it's 10. Yeah. yeah. And it, is it, it's either 6 or 7 to 10, mostly, in the residential area. Yeah. So if our earliest quiet hour is 10 p.m., yeah. it makes sense that this would match our earliest quiet hour. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I mean, Councilor Patton? That's good. Yeah, so regarding the timing, I was just thinking about this. You know, I, I understand about uh, you know, people are tend to be out more during the summer. If we really wanted to be kind of flexible with this, it seems like if we did seven to nine in like October through um, March, and then eight to 10 p.m. April through September, you could essentially say that the reason we're giving people a little uh, later time, or no, I think if you were to define it by those areas, it would, to me, it seems like it would make sense if you were to define it by those seasons. I like the day, daylight savings times. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Giving people a little more wiggle room as far as that, um, giving people a little more wiggle room. Where was I going? Yeah, no, I think that would be good. I'm, I'd be a fan for that so that they're, so that things are cleaned up a little earlier. I guess one of the things, one of the concerns I have regarding the whole tag conversation, it comes back to the com to the compliance portion, right? One of the things that's crucial in all of this is that if we're going to nail somebody for this tag thing, everybody has to get nailed even. And I can guarantee you, just in the walking that I do around my neighborhood, there are people who have cars parked down the street that have out of date tags mm -hmm. uh, for a short period of time or long periods of time. So if the city plans on, on using that as a method of control, then we're going to have to make sure to get everybody. Every day, someone is going to have to drive around, an officer is going to have to drive around the city to check every single tag on every single car that's parked on the street. And if there's one that's out of date, it's gotta be tagged. And that to me seems like a lot of work. Um, so I just think we need to be careful, you know, when it comes to that. Um, some of the things that, that stick out to me on this, um, I, I don't have any problems with, with this per se. Everything seems to make sense. Uh, one of the things that stuck out was for parades. So in here it says in section C, uh, the city administrator or designee may temporarily authorize camping or storage of personal property in the city for various things. And some of them are special events. I know this is kind of splitting hairs, but technically the things that are defined as campsite items are things that people would use for the for the July parade mm -hmm. or the pop-ups or the pop-ups yeah. and those sort of things. So I think in, in an effort to make sure that our bases are being covered legally, uh, Scott needs to make sure that whenever one of those events are happening in the city, there is some sort of uh, special discount or special event permit or something that's issued to cover those people because I don't I, I don't want to see someone trying to use this as a tool to say ha 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 we found a loophole now we're going to nail you mm -hmm. if, if we do that we need to make sure that that, that base is being covered every time there's something in that does that seem make sense and seem reasonable you're not wrong yeah. so I just want to understand that last so you're talking like using the 4th of July as an example so if what? the 4th of July Independence Day celebration Right, so if people are setting up a canopy, mm -hmm. you're, if, if I'm hearing you correctly, are equating that to 
How's that any different than doing a tent? Exactly. Or laying out a blanket. It's a temporary or shelter. Putting right? up yeah. a chair in a residential area, right? Because the parade route goes through a residential area, and we're saying yeah. that they cannot put a camp up in the city's right of way in a residential area. Well, then do we do, do we change the definition of what a camp is? No, because to me, it may there is there is a there's an escape escape clause in here to say that. <laughs> The city administrator can allow those things on special for special occasions. So it would just be a matter of saying, hey, for the 4th of July event, between the hours of X and X, camp, camping will be allowed in these areas. For so these that hours. Way, during those hours. Yeah. So that way it covers the city's base. Mm -hmm. And then when that period is over, that restriction is lifted. <laughs> Yes. So you're, that makes sense legally? It does. It, I, we do have currently in here, it says in conjunction with a special permit. Yeah. Um, or, but we, there's also a way in which the city administrator may adopt ad administrative rules. So we could also make some administrative rules for the city administrator to say, yes, we'll recognize city sponsored events and then we'll recognize. <clears throat> You know, various, yeah. various I think, other I think just, I, I think just for me, that is one thing that stuck out is to protect yeah. those sort of events from someone coming in and saying, well, you're allowing it here, but now you're not allowing it all these other times. What's the deal? That that would just sort of cover the cities. So you're just talking about adding verbiage in here. Well, the verb, to me, the verbiage is already in here. It's just a yeah. matter of yeah. we have to have city administrator policies. creating that creating that process, that paper to say that it's okay to do it. So what I'm so what I'm envisioning then is like great, so if I'm gonna put up a tent or a canopy or lay down blankets and I gotta come to City Hall and get a permit for the day. No. No, he's he's saying, I'm saying for the fourth of July. Right. But the they, street when dance the 4th of or July the... happens right. or when there's the concert in the park or whatever, that event just says, hey, we need a, th a paper to say that any Camp, any quote unquote camping, blankets, chairs in this area are okay for these periods of time. And the city administrator says, yes, that's fine. Not individuals coming and requesting it, the event requesting You can put blankets in the park to listen to the music Correct. from six to eight or from we, five to So basically, nine. that'd be a proactive city administrator task yeah. to say, to just kind of release that citywide saying, maybe a city memo saying during these times. Is yeah, that what I you're asking? Is that, that we proactively think about that we, during we do we yeah. do issue we do issue special mind. event permits that oh. um, for for events yeah. uh, like the ones that we're talking about. Great so we and, we could we could just add that to the special event permitting yeah. that yeah, that I authorize. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Because we do have a, a section here that does say in conjunction with special event permit or by your your rules as well. So. It, we could do both, even frankly. So our permit process could say this covers also, you know, people enjoying the parade route, and then you can you can say uh, in in rules that you know city sponsored events and uh, permitted events have you know recognized uh, folks experiencing those things in certain ways that use you know, certain equipment. Yeah, and I know it sounds silly. It might sound silly and nitpicky, but I have a friend that worked for a company where there's a person out there that goes around and just checks websites to see if they're hearing compliant mm -hmm. or hearing impaired and compliant. And if they yeah. aren't, People they things. slap them with a $5,000 lawsuit and that's how they make their money. Mm -hmm. I would not... Yeah, and I would not want someone to say, hey... <laughs> we're we're going to wait for Camby to do you know to have a parade and they have thousands of people all over the sidewalk in a residential area with a sidewalk to show mm -hmm. them you know this is where the flaw is in your system. Yeah. That's that's why that sticks out to me. Why okay. I would like to see something like that. I like it. like put in place. <clears throat> I have some other things, but I've talked for a little bit. So um, to your uh, aspect of making it seasonal or tying it to daylight savings, um, I think that's not a. I think that's a, not a bad workaround uh, piece to it. I um, I get a little heartburn about moving the front end to eight o'clock. Thank you. Because we've got downtown businesses and employees that are showing up at seven o'clock. I I think leaving the front end at seven, but then adjusting the back end to moving it based on the. Um, 
time change, you know, the time change with that. I agree. Yes, and now it strikes me why I thought that was a good idea. Legally, you could say the reason we're giving people an extra hour during the winter months is because it gets colder sooner. And this way they can get their camp set up and get snuggled in before it really gets cold, whereas in the summertime that doesn't happen until later. So yeah. that to me seems like a good justification. Are you okay with keeping it at seven all yeah, year that's though? Fine. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's why I put that there. <clears throat> no, I think that's I think that's a fair compromise to say it's seven o'clock all the time and then adjust the, the start hour. The back end. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I would not to put more work on you guys, but I, oh. I might suggest that we adjust our noise ordinances in the same way to our quiet time. Well oh. yeah. In, in similar fashion. And one last question kind of around this timing thing. When does cat start running? Oh. Six, I think. Five in the morning? Yeah. Oh, five in the morning? Okay, because that was the other thing I wanted to just, you know, if, if Kat started to give public transit time yeah. to, to handle the capacity of people yeah. maybe needing to move. So that's great. It might, it might be 5.30 or something. Yeah. But I know, know it's like, by 6. Yeah, yeah. So 7 okay. o'clock would more than accommodate. Yeah. yeah, I think it's headed towards Oregon City by, by 5. So, okay. Yes, Councilor Davis. Just comment to the police chief. I uh, just wanted to thank you guys for, I received a couple complaints around Fred Myers. Apparently there's been some people sleeping in the alcoves at the dentist office there and you guys have responded right away and got the people to move, but we're yeah. starting to see an increase yeah. down those there. Those are you know, private properties a little easier, right? Because if yeah. they want them. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. Uh, apparently employees are getting there early and finding people sleeping in their alcoves and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, I had another question. So you brought up an interesting point about a, um, sidewalk, versus, sidewalk camping versus street slash car camping. So if if someone has is sleeping or set up camp whatever at ten o'clock at night mm -hmm. and they're here in the plaza, yeah, that's totally okay. And we're gonna move that, you know, we're we're gonna come okay, it's yep. six o'clock, seven o'clock, time to move on. Correct. Is that now if I'm parked in one of the parking spots right here next to in the street in my car camping, that doesn't hold the same. You're not going to come and knock on my window at six, seven o'clock in the morning and tell me it's time to move, or you are I doing mean, this yeah. camping ordinance. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. If, because if we know they're in there and, or we get a complaint, right? Yes. Okay. So that doesn't that doesn't adhere to that seventy two hour. And they have to rule. move a block. No, right? but there's some. Here's the thing. Yeah, they're supposed to get in and potentially move and then also uh the, the idea there is now you're awake hopefully you you know get about your day I, it's a little bit harder in a car because people could just drive somewhere else and sure. just you know okay, I just sleep okay. in their car thank you I people just nap in their car sometimes uh, i'll have a follow-up here yeah go ahead. Uh, i would like us to put in uh in 9.25.020 parent four i would like us to call out uh licensed vehicles I think that while I understand that legally parked or you know there's something out there I think if we can put licensed vehicles in there to ensure that we don't have any kind of um, pushback on people saying it doesn't say that in your code um, if we can just put that in there to, to have it as part of our code that if you're if you are going to be camped on the street your vehicle must have current license tags what, so if I said legally parked and uh, this is kind of to um, echo uh, Councillor Hensley's comment which is the legally does say that so if we say legally then do we put in parentheses to include currently registered vehicles mm -hmm. that sort of thing I think that would be yeah, fine to yeah. include so that also the other legal reasons right yeah. yes I just, yeah. I just think that if we that puts a lot of gray area if you don't specifically call that out mm -hmm. what what is legally parked is it the form and how you're parked is it the way your wheels are turned or does it include your current your take your vehicle yeah. being currently licensed I think a currently licensed vehicle should be yeah, especially since that's a, a big issue is a lot of the, the campers are in unlicensed mm -hmm. vehicles. Yeah. And yeah, that was kind of my follow-up question because to, to Councilor Baden's point too, like, well, if I, do we, it, by the sounds of it, we've got to keep 
we got to take the ambiguity out of it, right? So, like, if our code enforcement officer pulls up on a house, there's a difference between me keeping my '65 Mustang that I'm rebuilding out on the street versus the car that I'm cam versus a car that's being camped in. Mm -hmm. We can't just leave that arbitrarily to code enforcement to determine. You know, that's somebody's car that's just their their project car versus one that's being camped in. Yeah. So we've got to take the purpose, we've got to take that ambiguity out, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what Council Varg is suggesting takes that ambiguity out, or does that create an unfair practice in some way? No, it, what it does is it, 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 it reminds folks who are reading it that part of the legality of it is to make sure that you have current registration if you're parked on the street. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I'm just wondering, um, a logistic piece, are we going, are we considering adding signage to the prohibited areas to say no camping pursuant to ordinance blah blah? Yeah, I think it would be uh, advantageous to be as communicative as possible, especially along um, all of our day use, because we were talking about the day use in uh, uh, recreational areas uh, have a, a bit of protection from the 72-hour rule um, because uh, they don't, day use uh, areas don't, don't fall under that particular law, they're excluded from it, which means that you don't have to wait 72 hours to remove um, mm -hmm. the, the equipment. And are we so, so like in a weight park, you don't have to wait for it to kill the grass 72 hours. You can make them pick it up. Right. Yeah. But what about like the, the parking, camping, and car situation in residential areas? Are, I mean, are we looking, do we have to notice in residential areas no camping, or can we just... You don't assume have to. that people read the ordinance, which yeah. I doubt they would, but I'm just wondering what kind of notification do we have to give folks well, that you can't camp, camp well, in that's a residential what's so area? that's weird if you think about all the ordinances when you move into town, unless you're kind of wonky, you don't usually read all the ordinances to see if you can have chickens or possums or, you know what I mean? Like, right. Like, so, you, and most people don't, <laughs> don't research that sort of thing in advance, right. you know what I mean? So. Um, yeah, the the idea. Well, it's weird, isn't it? Young know, you know one, maybe he's in the possum husbandry. Yeah, yeah. You don't know. But anyway, anyway, I think some people would be shocked to find out what some of the ordinances actually are in their town. But this seems to be one that the police can go up because code and, and code enforcement too. Because frankly, this is the case law kind of says that we should probably use more code enforcement folks and maybe even brand and behavior you know, specialist type folks to try to gain compliance. Because truly, if you hand somebody a ticket and it's going to be a month before their court date, you're probably going to have to talk to them a few more times anyway. So you might as well explain the ordinance, you know, and explain it again and just kind of really try to gain compliance that way. So um, more with, with education as more well. More a handout that Carrie can give folks when he has, she has to talk to them and they have it. And yeah. I'm, just, I'm just wanting to make sure that we're clear to people these are the rules, and this is why we're talking to you. Yeah. But I don't want signs everywhere yeah. necessarily. So I was just wondering yeah. how we're going to inform folks. I would just say signage along our linear park, for instance, would be a really good idea. You know, occasionally just because the logging trail. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that would mm -hmm. be a good yeah. place for actual signage. That would signage. be a really good one. Mm -hmm. My, I just wanted to check in on Chris. Did he, has he typed in anything? <laughs> Any questions no. or hands okay. up? Thing? Just wanted to just <laughs> wanted to make check on him. Uh, I'll go to Council Davis and I'll come to Council Farwick. Uh, good job. I just hope we can move this forward quickly because it's getting worse on Pine Street. Okay. We now have the the little orange car with the muffler hanging out, and they're using you that go. as their storage bin. You go. <laughs> yeah, I got, I yeah. Got pictures you, go. you go. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. Pictures texted me today too. So. A flashback yeah. from the eighties. Um, <laughs> the uh, so okay. Well, we can if if these are the parameters, and and I thought I heard Ken, Councilor Patton say that he might have had some other. I, I'm trying to also think about how to say, so public safety buildings being a good idea, uh, also maybe other essential utilities and things essential like that. Essential services yeah, or yeah. something like that. Because I mean, I think that there should be a limit to somebody showing up. Oh, a sure. lot of those places aren't open to the public per se, like the, you know. Well, it can be utility, for yeah, instance, yeah. if yeah. they're blocking the driveway. Yeah, essential or, or like u that, yeah. utility services, that sort of thing. 
Councilor Varwick and then Councilor Patton. Yeah, Joe, on, so if we're to put any signage out, for mm -hmm. example, Pine Street, I think that's a great place for us to put some signage out. Mm -hmm. Are we, do we run into any um, difficulties if we put them one place but not another, or is that, is that something that we can, I mean, that's kind of, obviously that's our problem yeah. area, right, Pine Street. So can we put signage up there but also not put it up in, in other areas yeah, that are residential. You don't have to put signage up everywhere, but the idea, it, all of this could be baked back into that whole reasonableness too, right? So like if, if there's an area that seems to need constant reminders, then awesome place for a sign. You know what I mean? Because then you're even being more reasonable. You, you don't need to come and have somebody explain it to them three times. There's also a sign that's Presumably explained it to them all day long. Right, and I believe that would be helpful for you guys, right? Especially right. on like in a trouble area like Pine Street of saying, hey, listen, there's a sign right in front of your car. <laughs> you can't be doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So either move on or, you know. Yeah. Anytime they have advance warning and they know, right, if we cite, give them a citation, they go to court, it helps. The, the <laughs> but officer, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Hello. Yeah. Right in front of you. Councilor Patty. Okay. Okay. Uh, I guess uh, just a few things. So regarding the signage, it seems if we really are worried about making sure that people know about this, it se would seem to make sense to put some sort of signage at the main entry points of town, right? Like a lot of towns will post that stuff as you come into town to say, you know, these are the parking hours or things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Like if we were really worried about signage and not mm -hmm. having them everywhere, something like that might make sense. For me, a couple of other things that I've got on here is, and, and I think if when it comes to court, this being challenged in court, the, we're saying these are the restrictions to this, but I think it would behoove us to have a plan of what to do f to help folks who are in this situation. Mm -hmm. So what is the can be police officers or the code enforcement agent given as far as saying here is some of the resources that you can here's some of the numbers that you can call here's some of the places that you can go here's a list of resources to try and help you in this situation help you out of this situation so that way okay. if if we're if we're nailing people on this we're also trying to give them the benefit of, of giving them some of this information to try and help them in the situation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Well, and I will say this much. I, I've had several conversations with uh, Chief Tro here, and he's even gone out and spoken with some, some of the very specific individuals. And they have said, I'm on the wait list for some of these services. I'm on the wait list for the Canby Center for you know, housing and, you know, kind of a conversation usually does start to unearth those sorts of things, but you're right. We could even have, um, you know, something that we can hand them that says, here's the rules, but then also here's the resources. Yes. I think that would be, I think that would be a really good ad. Uh, another thing that I had brought up the last time is, are we doing anything to actively count the number of homeless folks that are in the city. Because as I said before, it seems like more and more the funding to try and combat this or to try and help these people is based on the level of homelessness that you have in your area. So it would seem to make sense to me that the city begin to build some sort of data on numbers that we have here so that if funding does come available, we can say, Here's, here's our numbers. Where could we fall into this situation? And this is how far our numbers go back. Does that make sense and seem reasonable? No, that's a good idea. I, I know a couple of things on, on definition of homeless varies, like in the school district, it varies from what maybe we would consider homeless, right? Okay. And then we also have a transient population. Then they may, they may stay here a week and go to Oregon City for a week and go somewhere else for a week. And so, you know, do you count that, right? If they're, tra if they're truly transient and leaving. Um, you know, we could, our officers know exactly how many homeless there are in Canada that, that stay, right? Okay. And it's, and it's under 10 most of the year. Okay. Uh, sometimes, again, transient and stuff in the summer, it, it could go up and stuff. So we could get a pretty good count of people because we're the ones that get the calls on them, right? Sure. We, we know. I mean, our, our officers, that it's, they know their names. They know, you know, where they are. They know, you know, their backgrounds and stuff like that. So. And if that's the case, then maybe it would make sense for us to put some definitions around that, of uh, you know, some internal definitions around that, and at least start to record that data 
for if the day comes where, you know, the county or the state magically rolls out a wheelbarrow full of cash and say who, you know, <laughs> depending on how many people you've got in your area depends on how long you get to stay in the money machine. Do you realize Maybe what county and we'll state we're in? Huh? Do you realize what county and state we're in? Well, you never know. <laughs> you know, I I always am a wishful thinker. So that Fair that's optimist. That exactly. <laughs> so that that seems like something. An, another one, and it could be that I just am not reading this right, but if you go as part of this ordinance to 12.24.040, possession and consumption of alcoholic beverages, yep. C, I have no clue what that's talking about. Um, I have read and read this, and it se- I, I don't understand what it's trying to do. Well, so, 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 what, what page so are you on? It's, it's on page four of the packet, and it's... Under okay. additional, it's it's after uh, violations. Oh, yeah. So see, it says twelve twenty four zero four zero. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It is an affirmative offense that the possession. Oh, defense. Or, Sorry. Oh, defense. defense. Yes. Oh, I'm like, how is it? Yeah, yeah, if yeah. We're, we're we're it's an offense if they're okay. doing this as yeah. part of a city event. It no, just did not a, make any sense. That's to me. a typo. Sorry. <laughs> typo. Yeah. Okay. Good catch, Jason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. No. So so here's the thing. Um, Currently, and thank you for that. You understand that it's currently considered a uh, criminal uh, deal, and so, so technically, all the events where there's been alcohol on the pro- it's been illegal. Well, That's far. It, it, as far as the parks go, except for that, there is a um, there in in one of our codes is a provision for. Yeah, permitted events. Permitted. Right. But okay. But what we want to make sure and do is treat it similarly to if we're if we're also reducing some of the other miscellaneous penalties um, and in in years past um, I think some of the the uh, reasoning behind making something a crime versus making it a violation wasn't about the money at all it was about the arrest power and because you can't arrest, on a violation, but you can't arrest on a crime. But the the reality is, the only reason really that you would ever arrest is because they're they're basically being so disorderly that they would be committing a crime of disorderly conduct in the second degree anyway. And so we're trying to kind of decriminalize these things because some of them are on balance with the spirit of these cases that say that there are pieces of you know sleeping on the sidewalk, that sort of thing, um, as long as you're not blocking five feet of it, right? It's allowable, so that's why we're trying to keep keep in parity with those those sorts of things. So. Okay. Yeah. With that word change, that makes a whole lot more sense. Okay. So thank yeah. you. Perfect. Thank you. Good cat. <laughs> that's all I had. Yeah. A <clears throat> um, couple of pieces. Thank you, Councilor Patton. The um, if we could go to um, section. So it's nine point two four zero seven zero. Um, it's the page five of the packet. It's under the public indecency. Yeah, yeah. No person shall while in or in view of a public place, um, including public streets, perform an act of urination or defecation except until it's provided for yeah. that purpose. Um, is there a way that we can add something in there regarding um, just overall public nakedness? Um, he, he, there is provisions in... Um, law that allow for if it's for um, the arousal of the person or for somebody else, then it becomes public indecency, which is a crime. Um, so it it has to go with the intent of the nudity. Um, but yeah, the so there is there are crimes on balance. But you're just saying, well, I would I mean just be a public nudity just in. The, yeah, this problem. just kind of addresses acts. Yeah. Is but it's also um, biological acts. It doesn't actually specify lewd acts. Is that somewhere else? Well, no, this this was what is currently on our books. So and I'm happy to try to bring back even more, yeah, more ordinances if you guys are, you know, wanting various miscellaneous ordinances. There are there are several state statutes on point for this sort of behavior and the behaviors that kind of are associated with those things. But um, we ourselves, these offend just our city and our city alone. Um, and so it's they're kind of, you could be in violation of this and in violation of something else. So Canby would get a piece of it and then um, so would the state. Mm-hmm. Okay. If that makes sense. So are we interested in bringing back 
this piece well they added it sounds like to me that loot acts and well, things. it does sound like to me as this is as we've kind of gotten into this a little bit deeper this evening and it's a little like the threat threat of a sweater. You start pulling at it, and other things start to come out, mm-hmm. and you know that we got to look at it and kind of go, do we need to tighten that up? Is this no? I, and I don't know how much public nudity is occurring in this situation. Yeah. But if there's law, if there's things on the books already, yeah. does that you know does that need to be changed well, throughout? I, think- I don't know. I, I mean that's. I don't know, Mr. City Attorney. Do we need to tighten well, up those other pieces? Well, there well. are then. I mean, we'll have to go down the case law in what is allowable and what is considered, you know, um, punishable in terms of body parts and things like that. So, I mean, we do have to. There, there's, there's a lot to, to parse <laughs> out. If you, if you want your own, if you're going to legislate and do your own thing versus what the state's already done, okay. um, then you have to just make mm-hmm. sure that you're not. Okay. Cheap trail and oh. yeah, let me yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry. just add one. We don't get a lot of those calls. Okay, if if we do, we get them right. If right. someone's out there, and if there is state statute already in yeah, the yeah. books, we enforce those. Yeah, okay, for um, sure. So there are some provisions already for those types of okay. things. Okay, so Councilor Barwig, and then yeah, yeah, I think I mean I think it's a great conversation, but I think it's as the planning commission would tell you is as soon as you start opening code and start working through it, it just unravels more and more and more and more. And one thing I notice in a lot of our codes is that it, um, while they're great codes, they just are a little bit vague. A lot of our codes are vague. So I and think they can invite challenge. This one, maybe it's behooves us to look at all of our codes and maybe have a work session on that to say, do, is this something we even want to dive into? Because it's going to be a lot of work. And once we unpack this one, we're going to unpack the next one and the one after that and the one after that. And eventually it's going to be a big job, which probably should be done, but probably a conversation for another day. Okay. Well, exactly. And to, to Councilor Varwick's point, this is one of the things, this is why I mentioned maybe as, as one of the council goals to really take a hard look at the city charter, this would fall in that, mm-hmm. that same vein, is that a lot of this stuff has been on the books for decades and needs to be modernized and holes need to be plugged based on case law. Um, it is going to be a humongous project. It is going to take years to get it all done. And by taking it chunk by chunk and trying to identify coming up with a strategic plan, I know I love that word, yes. but coming up with a strategic plan of how to tackle it when different benchmarks are hit for reviewing this, I'm all for cracking this open, but it's going to take a while. And it needs to be done in a, in a very methodical way that makes sense. <clears throat> yeah. So we only have about like two minutes left. Joe, did we cover all the questions? What are the questions? Well, I'm going to return with the proposal, and I think we're close enough to try to get it in front of you for vote. Uh, even if you want to amend it, we can pass it as amended. Um, so m- next next meeting, maybe, or mm-hmm. somewhere close uh, in time. I'm, I'm hearing that for s- summer months, maybe extend the sleeping. The starting hour is only 7 a.m. Summer months, it extends to 10 p.m. And then in the winter months, it's 9 p.m. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then uh, public safety buildings and other essential utilities and services like that should be protected as well. Um, and then otherwise, I'm going to add the parenthetic about making sure that part of legally is um, the, also to include currently registered uh, vehicles as well. And fix the typo. And the defense thing. Yes, correct. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay. Circle that big. Chief Davis. Sorry, Councilor Davis. <laughs> I don't think. What are you going to say, Jim? <laughs> I'm okay. Because we're officially in a work session. Right <laughs> <laughs> Good job, you guys. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. Yes. Good. Cool. Thank you. Uh, we'll call an end to our work session and we'll begin our regular council meeting here in about six minutes.
Good evening. Welcome back, Canby. Um, if you were here for our work session, uh, appreciate you staying with us. We're now going to start our regular city council meeting. So if you please stand for the invocation and then the Pledge of Allegiance. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you bless our city. I ask you that you bless the citizens, the leaders that you have assembled here this evening. You provide us with wisdom and your grace. I also ask for prayers for um, the families and first responders in the tragedy in Turkey um, and those that are affected around the world that might have family that are there. And I also pray, I pray so much for um, the people in Ohio with the train derailment and the uh, chemical concerns that are now um, sweeping across that area. Um, just pray for a swift cleanup and um, as little devastation as possible in those things. I ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, next on our agenda this evening is the Iwo Jima Remembrance Day Proclamation. So the proclamation reads as follows. So Iwo Jima Remembrance Day. Uh, whereas on February 23rd, 1945, this country's armed forces were engaged in one of the most strategic and bloodiest battles of World War II, the battle for Iwo Jima. Whereas the Cambi Aurora Veterans of Foreign Affairs Wars Post and Auxiliary 6057 of the United States have deemed it fitting to erect a flagpole at the Cambi Adult Center in remembrance of those who took part in this great battle. Whereas each year the members of the Cambi Aurora Veterans of Foreign Wars Post 6057, their auxiliary, and their fellow veterans organizations and service organizations, i.e. Lewis and Clark Young Marines, Civil Air Patrol, Boy Scouts, J Junior ROTC, etc., have conducted a ceremony to rededicate this memorial and replace the flags on the flagpole. And whereas the flagpole located at the Canby Adult Center is the only memorial in the city of Canby dedicated to our veterans who made such significant personal sacrifices during World War II in defense of this great nation. Now, therefore, I, Brian Hodson, by virtue of the authority vested in me as the mayor of the city of Canby, do hereby proclaim February 25th, 2023 as Iwo Jima Remembrance Day. I further call upon all members of this community to join in commemorating this great event and celebrate the 76th anniversary of the end of World War II. Given under my hand this 15th day of February, 2023 in the city of Canby, Oregon. And I think we've got some people here to accept this this evening. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, sir. Very much appreciate it. I'm going to take a moment and say a few words. On uh, the behalf of the veterans the military veterans of America and the veterans of foreign war can be Aurora post 6057. I would very much like to thank you for this honor and for this remembrance. Thank you again. Thank you for your service. Um, Your Honor and distinguished counselors, <laughs> uh, my name is Irene Brashears, uh, representing the auxiliary of uh, Cambria Aurora 6057, and this is our service officer, Jerry Baggy, who represents the, the post. And we, again, thank you for this opportunity to uh, share with the community and with the council members the annual Iwo Jima flag raising ceremony. Um, you know, the World War II veterans are getting smaller and smaller in numbers, as you know. We're hoping we have a 97-year-old World War II Navy veteran 
who will be there. He was a submariner, and I believe he did a technical uh, work on the sub uh, on the torpedoes. So he could, if he's there, you know, healthy wise, he could tell you about how he'd fix the torpedoes to make them go. You know, type of thing. <laughs> so uh, we have flyers that Maya was so graciously enough to pass out to you to remind you Saturday, February 25th, 10 o'clock, uh, first at the Ackerman Gym and then to the flagpole uh, at the Canby Adult Center. We will have the Swan Island. Uh, Sixth Engineering uh, Battalion of Marines come to raise and lower the flags and present the folded flag to uh, one of our auxiliary members um, in honor of those that uh, passed away at Iwo Jima. So we hope that you can all come and invite your friends and family and fellow veterans to thank you very much for this honor. Thank you, Irene. Thank Sorry. you. Uh, next on the agenda this evening is citizen input and community announcements. Uh, this is an opportunity for audience members to address the city council on agendas not necessarily on the agenda. Um, if you are attending in person, please commit uh, complete a yellow testimony card then back there on the podium behind the gentleman in the black cowboy hat. Um, fill it out, bring it over here to Maya, our deputy city recorder, and she'll make sure that I get it. Um, each person will be given three minutes to speak, and staff and city council will make every effort to respond to the questions raised during the citizen input. Um, if you are wishing to address the council via Zoom or online, please notify the city recorder or deputy city recorder by 4 o'clock on the day of the meeting, and we'll make sure that we get you queued up. Maya, do we have anyone that's wanted to Zoom in tonight for comment? No? Okay. Um, first up this evening is Kevin Sterrett, who wanted to talk about the homeless, uh, homeless issue. Yeah. Thank you, members of the council. Congratulations on the new members. Um, Kevin Starrett, I live on Pine Street. I, I watched your uh, work session earlier. I appreciate that you're all addressing this homeless issue that we have that's becoming a real problem, Cammy. I, I know you're working as hard as you can. I've spoken to the police about some things, but one of the things that I think we really have to recognize if you drive down Pine Street, as Chief and I do every day, see that, you know, that particular issue, we've got a van there that somebody's been living in for some time, and I've been informed by the police that they have expectations that that person will be find some housing soon, but now we have a second vehicle parked behind it with no license plate, no registration. This is, the issue here is not just people who are subject to the ridiculous laws we have in this state that Jack rents up and make land impossible to use. These are not just people who aren't paying their rent. These are people who are largely mentally ill with drug addiction problems. And where, where I live, where the chief lives, we're very close to a lot of schools. I see young children and mothers with baby carriages walking around sometimes alone. The people we're dealing with here, I've seen downtown on Sunday going through garbage pails and stuff, they're not just urban campers. They're people who have serious issues this is a dangerous situation. And so and the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think we, I know we're doing what we can within the confines of the court cases and everything else, but there's some urgency here. You know, I, I imagine the chief can tell you that Portland fire is largely responding mostly to, you know, fires and tents. And if that becomes an issue here, we have, you know, our, our responders are put in a dangerous situation. Because, you know, when you show up at a homeless camp in Portland, sometimes you're showing up with dangerous armed people. And that's not really what we should be asking our firefighters to respond to. So I just really urge you to treat this as the serious problem it is. And the second thing is something I've spoken to some of you about, I've certainly spoken to the chief about, is you're all aware that there's a measure that passed that will have a profound effect on our police. It's ballot measure 114, and you know that we have an injunction against that currently. I can quite assure you that injunction is going to be overturned. I believe that's true. And based on things that happened today, I am very, very concerned that that could happen. If that happens, that is going to be a serious problem for our police. It's going to be a serious problem for our city and how we deal with it, because when this measure was enacted, no thought was given or no concern was expressed at all about how our local police were going to respond to these requirements and demands that simply cannot be met. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to talk to the chief about this, but I would really seriously suggest that you consider that this temporary injunction could be gone very soon. And if that happens, you're going to have to address it somehow as a city, and it is going to be very, very costly and dangerous for us. So I would appreciate it. I had an opportunity to chat with the police about that. Thank you. 
Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate it. Yeah, um, to the homelessness piece, yes, we um, we did have a work session this evening. Um, it was our second one, back to back meetings. Just we do understand the urgency around um, the verbiage and language that we do regarding the homelessness, and especially as it re revolves around the camping in residential areas as well as in our downtown. And so, and Pine Street is one of those streets that we've we know is an area that needs to be addressed. So. Um, Staff has been working really hard on getting that completed and back to us in a timely fashion. So we should have that in place and wrapped up here very soon. Um, so uh, next, uh, I have Clayton Rhodes. Let's talk about the fairgrounds. Even Clay. Thank you, Chairman and Councilors, for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, I just want to, I'm the new elected president of the Cambie Rodeo, and I would like to reach out to the city for supporting during our fair and rodeo. We need to try to get the city involved. I talked to Brian about, you know, talking to the city administrator about the, the banner, and we also have banners that go on the telephone poles that are down the main street. We can put banners up there, Cambie Rodeo and fair. Um, I wish I had numbers for you. I know the rodeo is probably 5,000 people a night. And I have at least 25 rooms a week that I have to farm out to other hotels. So I got like 10 of them staying in Oregon City, and I have another 15 in Wilsonville that I have to farm out. It's around $4,000. But if we could have a hotel... Because we're building a $16 million building right now at the fairgrounds. It's kind of almost like the court before the horse. Because we're going to have all these big events. Nobody wants to come because they can't stay anywhere. So it's just something to think about. We're really dire need in Camby to have a hotel for these big events. That building's going to do car shows, boat shows, garage sales, all that kind of stuff inside this big building. And it might hurt us. And a lot of business could really benefit by staying here during those events. So that's all I have. But just reaching out for a little support. Thank, Thank you. you. I appreciate it. Thank it's you. good to see you. Yeah, the um, it is on our agenda this evening as well to talk about the hotel piece. And I know that what transpires over at the event center and fairgrounds is, plays into that draw and that recruiting piece for us to work with organizations to bring a hotel here. So, um, yeah, I'm sure we'll hear more about that this evening. But um, I pointed out who Jerry is, and I pointed out who the city manager is. So that's Clay. Let's, <laughs> let's get together. And, Introductions. And Clay, everyone, everyone, that's Clay. Um, and don't let the black hat fool you. He's a good guy. Okay, um, he's a black hat, not a white hat. <laughs> uh, next, if, uh, Spencer Pollock. Uh, but ask me. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Uh, like you said, my name is Spencer Pollock. I am the newly elected uh, union president for Ask Me here in Canby. Um, I'm here tonight for the union. Uh, we are wanting to bring attention to uh, some concerns with employee morale between management and staff. Our administration team during a citywide meeting discussed and promised us a friendly, positive, and enjoyable workplace. This has generally been the way the relations have been in the past, but as of recently, the promises have fallen short. Uh, several departments have struggled with managerial support dealing with specific managers' behavior, causing physical and emotional stress to staff. We have tried to go through the proper channels to resolve these issues. When bringing these concerns forward, there is often little to no resolution for those city employees involved. Due to the lack of action from our administration, it leaves us with no other option but to come here before you tonight to ask for help in resolving these matters. We are asking you to direct your administrator to bring back a work environment based on mutual trust, acceptance, productivity, and respect, and the dignity of every member of the city staff as described in our personnel policies, Article 12.0. Thank you. Um, 
Scott, there's, presumably there's some idea on what's being asked there by the union steward. Well, Mr. Mayor and Council, I, I think as you, as you all know, it's it's typically not. This is not typically the forum that we would discuss personnel matters. No, it isn't. I just I so wanted to make sure that I appreciate the question, and I didn't. I don't. I mean that with respect. No, um, I take I, it that way. I I guess just in general. I mean, I certainly would uh, mm -hmm. take the comments into advisement. I I guess. More specifically, we would we would want to know more, but the, the appropriate way to do that would be for for our management team, our administrative team, to meet with the union representation. Okay, and that's that's all I wanted to yeah. make sure. I, and we right, will this do is that. not the forum to do yeah. that. Again, I just wanted. Yeah, I would. And we and we will do that. So I, I can certainly discuss that part of it. That we absolutely will reach out and follow up. Perfect. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, that concludes our. Uh, what does that conclude? Our, <laughs> thank you. I have my page turned over on my agenda. Um, moving into a presentation regarding the Canby Arts in the Park. Uh, Mr. Nelzine and Ms. Stickle are going to come up and give you a presentation. Co presenters. Perfect. What a team. What a team. Good evening. Good evening. Jamie Stickle, Economic Development Director. Jerry Nelson, Public Works Director. And we're here this evening to talk about the Arts and Parks Program, um, which was a concept that was brought forward by the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board and brought forward to city staff. Um, it's something that came together quite quickly um, and essentially is a way to move people throughout our park system um, and really foster the recreation side that, um, as we learned with the Parks and Recreation Master Plan, the city can be, um, we, have, we have some efforts that can be underway there. This is something that's relatively um, um, no to low cost. We're working with um, Artomatic, the art gallery over in the Grand Building, um, and they they are working with their artists to get donated pieces of art. And then um, Jerry, Jeff, and their crew are going to be working with the Parks Board to um, to hide that art in a different park throughout every month. The first of the month, the first clue will hit, and once a month um, after that time, uh, a, a new clue will come. So in, in the way that we've been planning for it is that it will be relatively general and then get more and more specific as time goes on until we find that someone has um, found the piece of art and let us know, and we're hoping to snap a picture with them um, and, and help to promote just the, the great parks system that we have. <clears throat> Do you have anything you want to add? No, I think you covered it. Thanks, Jamie. <laughs> Bright, brief, and to the point. Well, so, I will add, though, that um, they're going to keep it quiet for me so I don't spill the beans where the where the prize is. Um, <laughs> so, Mr. Nelzine, does that say that you don't keep secrets very well? Uh, no, I can, but on that one be tough because there's some cool prizes. <laughs> and what are those prizes? I, well, uh, you say what they are? It's, um, it's, a, a, it's a new piece of art um, donated by a different artist every month. So it's one prize, um, and it will be hidden in the park. A picture will be shown on the um, on Facebook. So it will be the City of Canby, Oregon Facebook page, Instagram page, on the city's website, um, and then also the, the Friends of Canby Parks um, Facebook page. And so we're just really trying to find ways residents, uh, tourists, this could be an opportunity for someone who's visiting to learn about this program. Um, it came as an idea that I think happened in Lincoln City that where they hid, I believe, 200 pieces of art mm -hmm. and people were able to move around and find them. Um, you know, I think it's a little rem uh, reminiscent of um, the painted rocks that, that happen in lots of cities, including in Canby. And I, I know my, my sister and her son love to find the painted rocks and they've even painted them themselves. And it's just a great partnership, I think, to be able to tie in with a local business who you know is working with local artists to really um, support our parks and recreation staff and and the systems that we have in place so this is a one piece of art every per month, month per yes. month yes and this starts when you only say March first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, guys I'm doing great tonight, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> don't, 
Counselor Patton, don't enjoy this too much. <laughs> March first. I'm enjoying it enough for everyone. <laughs> yes, Love March first. Excellent. That's That's awesome. Councilor Barbara, Councilor Davis. Yeah, <laughs> Jamie, thank you for the presentation. Jerry, thanks for showing up. You're welcome. <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, right. No, but seriously, thank you to both of you. Thank you to Eric and Shelley over at Artomatic. Thank you to our uh, yes, sure. Parks and Recreation Committee for this. This this is fun. You know, one of the things that I love about this community, um, and part of the reason that I like to be involved, is is just the unique things that we do that make Canby so special. I can't remember of any other community that I've ever lived in that's done something like this. And and so, obviously, there are communities that have Lincoln City as one of those that, that you mentioned. But um, this, this is so much fun, and, and I just I wanted to publicly say thank you to all of you guys for all of the work that you do to make Canby such a special place, and our city staff in, in included. Um, it, it's so fun to see these cool things. I know we have our scarecrow competition, the snowman competition, our parades. I remember in 2012 when we moved to Canby, um, and the first day we were here, we were, I don't know, maybe it was Place B Cafe back then. I think we stopped to get a cup of coffee, and we're like, what the heck is going on here? And it was just a little parade. I think it was a kitty caper parade or something like that. And, and and we fell in love with this town because of special little things like this. And um, I know that it, it is a lot of work, and Jerry, it will be a lot of work for you to not tattle on where the things are at. So yes. uh, maybe have somebody else hide it, not Jerry. Um, but these these are fun things that make Canby such a special place. So thank you guys for uh, going along with it and, and doing these, these things. And I hope that you guys know how much it means to our community when you do things like this. It might seem trite. It might seem silly. It might seem little. But it's just fun and it makes can be special so thank you thank you uh, it's only been less than a month that I brought these from the park and rec committee uh, to Scott and Scott got moved this forward so thank you for the presentation but more importantly thank you to Kara Hawkins yeah from the committee who put this together. Um, that committee is working very hard uh, to get things moving through from the Park and Rec Committee. So thank you for the presentation tonight, but thank you to the Park and Rec Committee. Absolutely, and if um, anybody is interested in participating in a unique way, um, there is an opportunity if there was a piece of art that wanted to be, if someone wanted to sponsor a piece of art um, or um, you know, even donate, they can contact me, so Jamie Stickle uh, at the city, and I would be able to connect them with Artomatic. And so if there's someone out there who really wants to see this program continue and wants to make sure that we're able to do so, um, we'd be happy to, to find sponsors and, and also promote if it was a for instance a business that wanted to sponsor um, find a way to promote that they were the sponsor of that month so we're really excited and we're really it's just gonna be a fun program and it's been fun to get together and brainstorm and um, so thank you hey council any other comments no I think it's awesome oh, it's great Jerry when's it start March 1st. Excellent. And it's on Facebook and Instagram? It will be on Facebook and on Instagram. Okay. And um, some of the information that's out there will be intentionally vague. So um, I'm sure we'll, we'll hear about that, but that's only going to, I hope, further the excitement and further the 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 talk about town. So while you're out in parks, and you'll and people will know that it is the art piece just so that we're not, you know, walking down the logging trail or down downtown and taking a piece of art from someone's yard, it will have a tag. <laughs> it will be promoted of what the piece of art is so that we can ensure that um, when that the finders keepers way of it will be um, appropriately attributed to that piece of art for the month. Great. And it's yeah. summer months, I'm assuming. Part summer months. Um, it starts March 1st. So the and first it goes all year or um, just we we are every we have plans through the hopefully winter. to get it through Fun. the end of end of the year. So awesome. We've we've done some initial brainstorming and um, for any of the fine details we asked uh, Mr. Nelzin to step out of the room so that <laughs> he doesn't ruin this. <laughs> oh, Excellent. Perfect. Okay. Thank you both. Wonderful. Thank Great. you. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks. Uh, next on the agenda is the uh, approval of the consent agenda. 
Mr. Mayor, I move to approve the consent agenda that includes the minutes of the January 4, 2023 City Council regular meeting, the OLCC annual liquor license renewals, the OLCC application for a full on-premises commercial license for guacamole bowl cuisine located at 1011 Southwest First Avenue, the OLCC application for a full on-premises commercial license for the train station tavern located at 911 Southwest Fourth Avenue, the reappointment of Chair Melody Thomas to the Cambie Utility Board for a term ending February 28, 2026, the reappointment of member Jack Pendleton to the Budget Committee for a term ending June 30, 2025, the appointment of member Scott Sassy to the Budget Committee for a term ending June 30, 2023, the appointment of member Lisa Potter to the Budget Committee for a term ending 20, June 30, 2025, and the appointments of members Tyler Frankie and Adrienne Carlson to the Transit Advisory Committee for terms ending March 31, 2025. Second. Second. <laughs> um, motion has been made by Council President Hensley and seconded by, did I say that, Var Var Padden? The Var Padden. Var Padden. <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Saved by Council Barway to approve the consent agenda, which includes the minutes of the January 4th, 2023 City Council regular meeting, the OLCC liquor, annual liquor license renewals, the OLCC application for a full on premise commercial license for guacamole bowl cuisine located at 1011 Southwest First Avenue the OLCC application for a full on-premise commercial license to the train station tavern located at 911 Southwest 4th Avenue, the reappointment of Melody Thompson to the CAM Utility Board, the reappointment of <coughs> member Jack Pendleton to the Budget Committee, the appointment of member Scott Sassy to the Budget Committee, the appointment of member Lisa Potter to the Budget Committee, and the appointment of, appointments of members Tyler Frankie and Adrienne Carlson to the Transit Advisory Committee. Any comment or question? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Your Honor, I, I will say uh, Councillor Banks is unable because of his connection to actually vote. So he said he's just going to abstain so there is no confusion. Okay. So we'll go with one abstention. Perfect. Thank you. So that passes uh, 4 zero, 1. Great. Uh, next on the agenda this evening is uh, resolution number 1379, a resolu resolution adopting a supplemental budget for the 2022 fiscal year. Conceded the consent agenda. Oh my gosh, I wrote my notes in the wrong spot. Thank you, sir. Yeah. I totally botched that. Thank you. Um, actually, we're going to move into a public hearing. Um, so the public first public hearing this evening is regarding the supplemental budget uh, regarding uh, parks. So my blurb regarding that is the matter presently before the hearing body requires a public hearing. All interested persons in attendance shall be heard on the matter. Opportunity was given to sign up or provide testimony. And at this time, no one has signed up to speak on this topic or has submitted comments or testimony. Uh, a decision shall be made by the hearing body at the close of the hearing, or the matter will be continued to a date certain in the future. Uh, this will be the only notice of the date that you will receive. Any, does anyone have any questions about the procedures of the hearing? Okay. Seeing none, um, we'll first start with the staff report, and then questions, if any, by the hearing body. And then I will open up for testimony to hear from proponents and then opponents, each uh, being given three minutes to speak on the matter. I will then close the public hearing. Any additional questions by the hearing body of staff and then discussion by the hearing body. And then we'll move to make an adoption of 1379, um, a resolution for the supplemental budget. Um, any other comments or questions? Great. Scott is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so this is a request for a supplemental budget that would transfer $150,000, <clears> excuse me, into the, the parks budget um, from the sources of the, um, from general fund money, contingency and unrestricted funds. Um, this has to do with the um, Maple Street Park sports courts, the AKA the pickleball 
courts that we built last year with uh, um, the support of our Parks and Rec Board. Um, we brought this to the council as a contract, and at that point in time, we um, acknowledged that the project was above the amount that we had budgeted. When we were when we were budgeting back in the, the budget cycle for the, the current fiscal year, which is you know last year, we didn't know at that time what the what the amount that we'd really need to do the pickleball court. So we just took a stab, put the money in, um, and um, we underestimated what what it was going to be. And also at the time, and, and of course some of that trend continues, the, the cost of construction and materials are are at a at a very high rate, so um, it simply is just uh, to balance our books to transfer some money from one part of our budget to the part that we actually spent the funds from. It's in the amount that we asked the council to award the project back in, uh, at, I believe it was early late spring or early summer to to complete the project. So. That's um, that's kind of the extent of it. Um, Jerry Nelzine is here as well, who um, actually might be able to help with some of the more technical parts of the questions of the project in terms of the cost, but that's really the, the extent of what the request is. Okay, thank you. Council President Hensley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and, and I apologize for not sending my question in advance, Scott. I've been super busy with some stuff and I kind of was digging into the packet admittedly today, I apologize. Um, but I did have a question regarding the funding, um, why we're going to transfer from the contingency and unrestricted funds when the um, staff report regarding ordinance 1559 that implemented the parks, the, the pickleball court, yeah. states that it's gonna come from SDCs. Yeah. So why aren't we going to just transfer from SDC and fill the hole that way? It seems that would be the cleaner, more appropriate way in my view. So explain yeah, to me I, please why that's... That's an excellent question. I appreciate you, appreciate the that you asked that. I actually meant to, to note that as well. So yes, we when we brought it forward, we um, we, we said that we were gonna recommend that we paid those out of, that, that would be, the difference would be paid out of STCs. Um, with um, so in my conversation with our finance director, um, we paid. So we paid. The project was completed quite some time ago. The bills were paid. Um, there was a um, I'll just call it a lack of information of transfer of information between our prior finance director and our current finance director as to how the how that project was going to be fully paid for. So it it has been paid for out of those funds for. Um, Budget compliance and audit purposes, it would be actually cleaner at this point if we if we just went with this recommendation. We we have um, we have more than sufficient funds to pay for it this way. We could go back and do it that way. The other piece, though, is um, that that also then leaves our parks STC funds more readily available for some of the uh, initiatives that we've got coming up, which quite frankly, are probably gonna exceed our available SDC funds. So we can do that, but for um, for auditing and for just kind of bookkeeping purposes, it's actually cleaner if we just do it in this fashion. But if the council wants me to go back and do it that way, I would be happy to make that happen. It's just, that's kind of how it happened. Okay, well, to follow up with that, I, I personally, Mr. Mayor, I would like to, Go back to the original ordinance where it's where we were stated that it was going to come from SDCs. This was the the pickleball courts was an expansion. It was um, a, an appropriate use of SDC funds. It was. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I don't really want personally. I don't want to dip into contingency funds where we can use the SDCs and it's an appropriate use of SDCs. And we were told we were going to be use, using SDCs. So I am not for the current proposal. I would like to see a transfer from SDCs back to the park maintenance fund. And that's up, I guess, for my colleagues to, dis to discuss, but that's, that's my feeling on the matter. Uh, and Scott, I'm sorry. Thank you for that, Council President Leslie. Um, explain to me again the, the, the move from SDC versus SDCs versus the methodology that you've opted for, what what was the the significant change there? Um, so when we pay when we pay for uh, when we basically when we pay our accounts payable and we pay our invoices, those come from some fund. the The information wasn't clear that we had 
So this, this happened kind of in the course of sort of the transfer of information between finance directors that, um, that the, the difference in the funds would come from SDCs would actually, <clears throat> we would actually have to have um, physically transferred some of those additional SDC funds into our parks account. So this all gets paid, we have a parks, we have a parks budget. Right. We have lots of different funding sources. There's general fund sources, we have fees, um, and we have SDCs that get put into that when our budget gets put together and approved. Um, and so, a lot of, because a lot of our, our money in the parks budget comes from the, the general fund, I think it was just assumed that that was being paid for with, with, with the general fund part of that money. So it's just a bookkeeping thing. We can, we can do it either way. It's just already been paid from that funding source and we would have to go back and sort of un, unwind those books and then put it back in. Okay. Um, okay. So yeah. Councilor Patton and then I have a follow-up question for I, I would like to see this amended to take this money from the SDCs. <clears throat> that if that's where it was, that was one of the things that was on the list for me was those those funds are for that purpose. That's where they came from originally. I I feel that this should be amended to bring it from the S S. Um, <clears throat> sorry, the SDCs. Okay, you have a follow up question. Uh, well, I was just. To that note, I, I was going to say, but it, it's a matter of unwinding. I'd rather unwind it to make it correct rather than just take the easy route. And um, I, I'd like to see it come from the SECs where it was appropriated from in the first place. And well, I don't necessarily hear it as an easy route. I hear it really <laughs> I, like, well, the cleaner route. I heard him say it would be just. It would be. It seems like that's the easier, cleaner way. But I would rather have it come from the appropriate fund, and and the way that it was originally stated that it was going to come from. Sure. Yes, Councilor uh, Council Davis. Um, Scott, if we took it from the SDCs, what will that do to the planned projects that have already been in front of the Park and Rec Committee? Because I know that each one of those pro uh, projects has a budget, and the Parks and Rec Committee are counting on those projects with the budgeted amounts for this year's budget. If we take it from the SDCs, that's going to impact, potentially impact, some of the other projects that the Park and Rec Committee are counting on that money being there for. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it'll affect, I'm, I'm certain it won't affect the, the current projects that are right in front of us. It probably, so what it does is, um, so it's $150,000. It would just draw down our SCC balance by $150,000. That won't impact any of the current projects in front of us. More, more so, what that'll do is somewhere a little further down the road, that will be $150,000 less in our SDC account that we can spend on other projects that we'll be working on probably for the next, say, three or four years. Right. So the current projects that are being discussed right in front of us, this isn't going to negatively right. impact that. It's yeah. it's further. It's a little further out. Yeah, I know that uh, the Park and Rec Committee is working hard on these projects and trying to project out even past this budget uh, into the future and stuff. So, so 150,000 is quite a bit of money in regards to the impacts to the Park and Rec fees. And uh, so, you know, I'd like to try to keep those fees whole uh, because we weren't aware that this 150 would be coming out of the, the projects that we're planning. So, so you're, you're proposing to follow the staff? I follow staff's recommendation. Okay. Um, questions for staff? Not so much questions, but more of a comment. I, I'm okay with it coming from either SDCs or from wherever it's coming from. I don't have um, a dog in the fight on that of where it comes from. But what? It's a question portion of the email. I'll save my comment for later then. Okay. The question person. Questions uh, for staff. I'll, I'll just add, if I may, Mr. Mayor, um, it, it kind of goes along with Councillor Davis's question and a little bit of the, the conversation just to assure you that either way, we have a balanced budget. It's just a choice of which um, source of funding that we can pay for this from. So there are the option is on the table. Mm -hmm. This is a recommendation just based on um, the way that the, the bill was already paid. We, again, we can change that, but it, it doesn't impact that any of our budgets are, are balanced. The, the real issue is 
Our parks fund is currently out of balance because we completed the pickleball court and we need to pay that back with some other source of funding. Those sources of funding are available to us and that is really just a choice. It's not a one, you know, nothing is going to be per se out of balance or anything to that nature. Okay. Council Barber. Let me form this in, ask this in the form of a question. Obviously, I understand that we have uh, communication gaps when we have transition. Get that. Um, will we be finding other areas where there was communication breakdown of where funds should have come from one fund, where it came from another, and how soon will we know that? And can we can we try and make sure that we're we're on top of that as we're heading into our budget season? Obviously, um, I want to make sure that we're not yeah. going to be um, looking at a whole bunch of other changes to where things should have come from versus where they will be coming. Yeah, we've um, I've had those conversations. To my knowledge, this is the only one. This one kind of just just it, it just it just kind of was a, a miss of the transfer of that information. I don't know of anything else. Uh, that's the point of <clears throat> doing the supplemental budget processes. So we we go back and we correct, make sure the budget is balanced before the, uh, the books are closed. Um, and it, it, yeah, so I don't I don't believe anything else. And of course, we're we're always looking, but this is the only thing that I'm aware of. Thank you. Yes, Council, uh, Council President Hensley, question for staff. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my concern also lies in the fact that, what, almost two years ago, we passed this as an ordinance. Being that in that staff report with the ordinance, we were told that the funds would come from certain areas, and we passed it based on that. I guess the question is, is it legal to change the way we pay for it because we passed it as an ordinance? And even if it's not, I would still like to stay true to the fact that this council was presented with information to vote on an ordinance. Based on that information, we passed it knowing it was going to come from SDC, so I would like to stay true to the, the original vote. But um, I guess, so that's my point on it. I want to stay true to the, the information we were given. We made, a, we made a vote based on that information. But is it even legal to change the funding source now? I'm well, just asking that as a curiosity question. Based on what, I'm, uh, what I know about this, and, and correct me if my facts are off, is the ordinance paid up to the lesser amount. And so the ordinance actually passed to pay for, is it 400? Seventy-five thousand, or whatever uh, it is, three ninety-five. Okay, and then so so this is above and beyond that amount. So we executed the law. Actually, it's it was we had budgeted, uh, I think, one hundred eighty thousand or something. Whatever. Oh, the, oh the, I the see. One hundred fifty thousand is the difference so to get to the. Three but we followed the ordinance to the T. It's just there wasn't enough after we had already actualized on the ordinance, if that makes sense. Right, but in the staff report that we were given when we voted on this, it says the funding would be $180,000 from parks maintenance fee with the remainder of the project cost funded with parks SDCs. Yeah. Oh, so it I wasn't a, yeah. a number given. It was just 180 dollars was going to come from parks maintenance and the rest from SDC. Okay. So that's why I'm kind of wondering. We, we passed this ordinance course. based on the information that the balance would come from SDCs. We, so we I would like to yeah. stay true we to did, that vote. Joe, we did present that way. And, and I, but I guess my question is, if from the legal standpoint, is that the ordinance approves us to implement the contract. But I, I do agree with you, Council yeah. Hensley, that we did present that, and if that's the wish of the council, we'll we'll just amend the the bookkeeping. I'm not sure if we'll have to repost the um, the public hearing to because we we have to actually notice this as a public hearing the way that we're transferring the funds. So we may have to repost and bring it back to you if you desire to go that direction. Well, and the other question being yeah. is if it was passed by ordinance, yeah. do we have to revise the ordinance if we're not going to pay it out of SDCs? So that might be well, something I mean, we need to do a little more research on. Yeah, thank you. I do need to do research on it. If uh, What I'm thinking right now is the operative language in the ordinance would be so is it is it down in there where it says <coughs> city of city of can be ordains? I don't have it right in front of me. Mm -hmm. um, is is the language that you're quoting is it one of the whereases or is it one of the um, is it the operative language in the bottom? The, where the funding comes from. Um, whereas. Do you see what I'm seeing? Because there's Actually, operative it, language after they, you guys ordained. If if you pass the law, you ordained that operative 
if it if it is supposed to operate, if the operative language calls for it, I would say that is the actual idea of the law. Okay, so the idea of the law then, it, it sounds like we're okay there because uh -huh. it's skimming this ordinance quickly on the minute here. Um, it looks like it, it's just the, the, the ordinance ordains that we will pay the 395 to the contractor. But not in a particular way. But in the staff report that we're yeah. given, to, the information we're given on which we're going to make our decision to vote on said ordinance, yeah. it tells us we're going to be taking the balance from SDCs. Well, and I will say this. We might have made a different vote if it was a different funding mechanism. Is my point. Well, so. and and here's here's a couple of issues with this, legally speaking, right? It's like usually if people are passing laws, you, you know this yourself because you go down to Salem a lot, right? Is you have to look at the legislative history and see, you know, what what the kind of the spirit of behind it. But then you also look at kind of why we do this as a law to begin with, and we do this as a law because in our charter there's those miscellaneous provisions at the end that say anything over fifty thousand has to be passed by an ordinance. So, so sometimes, I guess, you, can, you could read it as we wanted to make sure and get it in front of you because our ordinance requires that anything over 50,000 expenditure has to come in front of you. In the whereas is sometimes, you know, you find out kind of the intentionality and then, but the actual effect or the, or the power of the law in an ordinance is in the the operative language in the bottom. So that's why I asked about that. So, yeah. so, and I know this all sounds very gray, but the idea is, yeah, we, we have to look back and see what the legislative intent was, whether or not it was truly just, let's get this part done, or whether it truly was, let's only use SDCs. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and I would assume that some of the voting members had different intents, maybe. I don't know. So we're not probably running afoul of being not legal a because it sounds like we've got our T's crossed there. But and this is the new back to yeah, the spirit of the vote. We were given information saying that the balance would come from SDCs. So I stand by my vote at that time saying I thought it was coming from SDC, so I would like it to still come from the, yeah. the funding source that I was told it would be. Okay. Councilor Patton. Okay, I got some questions here. Have we opened this hearing for the public input yet? We have not. We're still asking staff questions. Okay, so my question is, are we able to make an amendment to this moat, to this ordinance with the change in funds? And then open up our public hearing for people to to have to weigh in on this and not run afoul of things. Well, I, I think the ordinance itself doesn't hamstring you just because the operative language doesn't say exactly how the funds are going to be spent. But I think it's a, the value of a body is that you guys all talk and talk about what your intent was and whether or not you want it to be that way or not. Um, it, as far as an ordinance, you would in order for that to take effect. You would have to amend it, and then you'd have to um, repost it. Well, we would have we'd have to post whatever ordinance it is first, so it'd have to be noticed, and then we would have to have two readings of it, and then the thirty day waiting period. So that's a that's a longer. Uh, I we have time, frankly. What supplemental budgets uh, only have to be done within this budget year. So I mean, so technically you could wait, but so I'm just trying to give you all your options here. So, so then would we fail this or table it if there's a majority of council that would like to see it come from SDCs? You would table it, I believe, because then we, because we haven't properly noticed a first reading. Okay. Yeah. Of an amended. So we could amend, amend it and yeah. then just go to if second If you believe reading. that it needs to be amended. It won't need to be amended. <laughs> If you just want to use SDCs, correct? Are we talking about the original ordinance? Yeah, yeah. And, and so we just looked up, so the original ordinance that uh, from this staff report in July of 21 does not, the oh. ordinance does not. Are you talking about the, the it's ordinance not in the for, it's in for the this report. particular? Yeah, no, I'm talking about this right here, what's on the table now. Can so we make an it's amendment? It's a resolution. Okay, resolution. Yeah, so you we can make an amendment to this resolution correct. tonight yes. to say we're going to pull this money from SDCs, then open up the public hearing, right, mm -hmm. and then just have it done with. If a majority of council feels that this should come out of SDCs, can we just do that and not dink us around for another two weeks? But is it? I mean, that's a, an Eric question in, in a sense that whether or not he can effectuate that at the mm -hmm. financial level. But I believe he can, and I believe your will is your your power is to do that, and your ability to to amend a resolution in front of you is fine. 
because it's up for discussion. There's a public hearing, and you guys are able to amend your actions Wonderful. in real time if you want. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I hardly think it's dinking around for two more weeks if we are deciding where to spend $150,000. I think that that is it's a significant amount of money if it affects our Parks and Rec Committee on what jobs they can do. I think that we owe it to our citizens to take the time to properly figure out where this money should come from. I, If it's two more weeks or four more weeks, I think it's within the amount of time that we're going to, you know, before our budget starts. And so I think we should take the proper amount of time to really determine um, how we should do it. My preference, I, I'm not comfortable making a vote tonight on this, not fully understanding where it was supposed to come from. My question, Joe, is could we push this out to a date certain, say it is two weeks from now for our first reading, so that we can have the proper information, so that we can make a good decision based on fact, not on guesses. Yes. And I, it, I, but I guess the other question too, and I, I was trying to hear your question at the same time, um, is whether or not you want to, because you've noticed properly a public hearing and the public needs to be heard on any one of these things, if you want to have the public hearing now, mm -hmm. take the testimony now, that can be part of the record, then you can set it aside, table it for the time being, for it to bring it back a date certain on the vote. Well, Whether or not you want to amend your, your resolution or not. Catherine, thank Davis, you. and I'll come back thank to Thank you, Joe. Please. That's what I was going to ask, that we move forward with the public hearing. Let's hear what the public has to say. Um, again, I would ask my fellow counselors to keep in mind I'm the representative of the Park and Rec Committee and have feelings of the Park and Rec Committee on this as well. But I would like to move forward with the posted public hearing and see what uh, the public has to say, and then I'll be prepared to make a motion. Okay. Councilor Patton. So to me, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. I think we just need to get this done. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and make a motion to amend this to uh, pull the funding out of SDCs. A second. OK, there's a motion on the table to change the direction to pull or reallocate funds from SDCs versus reserve funding to... Before you vote on it, though, you have to hit, take public testimony. Oh, that's mm -hmm. great. Yeah, that's yeah. true. I did one quick okay. question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So the motion can s remain there. We will yeah, do if the it's motion. First, if it's first and seconded, but you cannot vote on it until after public testimony. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Quick logistics question, if I may. Quick, and then Mr. Archer has a question. Well, it's actually Archer. actually for, I suppose, the questions from Maya, just logistics. Is the finance director, Eric, on Zoom? Is he listening to this so he has this information, or is he available for comment he's, or question? He's he's on vacation. He's, he's, on, he's on some personal time. Okay, so, so he's, he's not in, zoomed in. So, <clears throat> in so fact... So he'll have to read this in the minutes. Well, I'll, like, I'll converse with him. Okay, okay, thank you. So that actually, may I, Mr. Mayor, yeah. just a comment, because you, you have a motion, I know, on the table here. Um, my recommendation would be that <clears throat> that your motion might might suggest that that you recommend that we we redraft this for you in such a way whatever the will of the council is that you'd prefer whether it's to change it back to the STCs or leave as is and and bring it back to a future council date because. <clears throat> I would like to review this with our finance director, make sure we've got all the T's crossed, I's dotted, because there is some bookkeeping and there's some pieces that connect to um, our accounting and our auditing. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure we've got all those things in order and present you with the proper um, with the proper mechanism to approve. So if it's the will of council to change your direction, um, my preference would be that you would ask us to bring that back to you at a, at a different meeting. We have until um, actually beyond the, the end of our current fiscal year, you can still amend uh, even even beyond that. So we we have a we have a good amount of time. We're just uh, we're just taking care of this just because it was available to us to do that. We wanted to get ahead of it, but we have plenty of time to amend it. So. It would be great if the motion might be such that we would be given direction to bring back what your what your will is to do and make sure that we do that in the proper manner. So does that mean, and this is just for a question based on this, so does that mean you're asking that this motion not make the change, 
but still not v make the initial vote tonight on it. Table it for a future meeting, you could say to a date certain, or you could say it's soon. Your um, but that your direction would be that we bring back the mechanism for it to be paid for in the manner that is being proposed, if that's the will of the council. And just simply so we can make sure that we've got everything. It's it's a supplemental budget action. It's just it's just correcting uh, the books for auditing purposes. But if there's going to be a change in the in what we've actually posted, I think we'd be better off if we were re would re re notice that repost it and make sure everything is is to the to the way that the council wishes us to be noticed or uh, uh, to, to be acted upon. I really just want this dealt with tonight. This is just kind of crazy. So, um, <clears throat> knowing the logistics of all this, I guess I will cave and I will amend the motion to make the change but have it come up at a later time. Does that work? So you're moving to direct staff to bring back a to council amended language to allocate funds from SDCs at yes. a future date. That's your motion? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Councilor. Um, I will second the amendment. Okay. So, okay, knowing that that's the case, do we then, Joe, still need the public? Thank you. Well, yeah, the public hearing, because of the notice requirements and everything, and if people showed up, it's it's we nice see. to make that record. Well, yeah. then um, I will open up the public hearing for testimony regarding the funds as discussed this evening. Um, I don't know if we had, I saw people getting up. I don't know if we've got any yellow cards that have come. Here you my, Look at the Look at the Are you a proponent or opponent? Just information. Okay. There you go. Then Mr. Perez, it is yours for three minutes. Hey, sir. How are you? Good evening, Mayor and City Councilman, the City Administrator. Um, from what I'm hearing, that what's going on with the council right here is, uh, first of all, I'd like to know if that's a legal document. Your staff report coming from City Hall, and if it is, would you follow it? Now, the other thing I have in mind is you're getting guidance from the city to you guys, okay? And you had already went through all of the council meetings to come to the SDC monies being got out of there to pay for that. But now they want to change it at the last moment, or they knew about it, and it should have been taken care of before we even came here. So to Rob from Peter, to pay Paul, I'm seeing gray areas, I'm seeing misdirection and miscommunication and a lack of integrity when you come to do this in the public. If that staff report says it was coming from the SDCs to fill in the gap of paying the bill, then you need to go with that. Because that's what you voted on as a council. So why are you doing all this unnecessary work that somebody brought upon you now and now you got another week or two or three weeks or whatever before the end of the budget turn in cycle that you're dealing with. It doesn't make sense. That's why I think it's very important that you have people in place at this city hall so it can run like a machine instead of people scattered all over the place. Whoever thought that you could run a city like this? You can't. And on this, I mean, I'm only speaking the truth, and I have three minutes, do I not? You do. Okay. I'm, I'm just. I'm just saying that a bit. you're getting misguided direction from City Hall because this is what you're going through right now. It's stated in the staff report the money is coming from the SDCs, and you voted on it. Now that's not true. So now you got to start shuffling paperwork around to make it balance out. I, it just doesn't make sense. Not good business. Thank you. Um, to, to that point, Mr. Perez, yes. um, it is not uncommon for us to get to the end of a budget year 
and have a number of items that we either have to shore up or reallocate funds yeah. to close funding gaps on. But to blame that, it on last staff well, I, and not and not take care of it ahead of time, not knowing what's going on with the budget and finances on who's paying who. I, and Thank I, you. And I, three I, minutes. This is also just public you're testimony. Yeah. Excuse, I got it. Okay. I, it's fine. I, but I, I'm again. I, I I get that it's testimony, and that's fine. But I will. I, I want to address some of this because, again, it. I don't think there's been a a, a bait and switch piece. I think there's. I think when you get a, a new finance director, as we've done. There may be different methodologies that they're looking at and, and using, and then we often have to look at, you know, what's restricted versus what's unrestricted. What's might be money that we can free up in a different way, which is what I think is what's being presented here. I don't think it's a bait and switch piece. I think we do need to be protective of our STCs, um, and what we've got in reserves is, or where these are coming from. I think it's a viable piece to take a look at. Obviously. And we're asking staff to go back and just reevaluate this, which but, is fine. But what was said is if it doesn't affect anything in the short term, it may affect something in the long term. That's exactly what I heard. No, and I heard that as well. Absolutely. And so, but long term, which end? The unrestricted side or the STC side? It's, it's you, there's going to be. It's coming from where it should be coming from. The SDCs. Then you make your adjustments after that. You got to have money for projects, and then you get from the right pot to balance. Well, thank you for your input, Greg. I appreciate it. Yes, Scott. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just, just to your comments, Mayor, and to some of the discussion with the council. Again, I just um, the uh, the method of funding to pay for the supplemental budget has been publicly noticed. It was publicly noticed in a newspaper. It's, it's been fully daylighted how we were proposing to do this budget adjustment. The disconnect piece was, um, I'm addressing the council now, yeah. not anybody else, just so that's clear, but there was no blame on staff or anything like that. It was just a transfer of, of information uh, that, that didn't occur in, in such a way We've just brought you a proposal that we can we can have a balanced budget, which is what my job is, is to bring you balanced budgets and keep it balanced throughout the year. Um, you certainly have the option of doing whatever you please, but the funding mechanism was was daylighted and was was put into our public document, and in fact was required because of the public hearing to be posted in a newspaper. So this has all been daylighted. We weren't we weren't trying to do anything other than that. The, the fact is that our, our finance director recommended that we that we just pay for these funding uh, the funding in this manner because that's how the bills had already been paid and it would it would just make more sense going you know kind of with, with our bookkeeping but again it's just a choice Mr. Mayor, I, I think we need to do a check-in. I know that these public hearings are supposed to go a certain way right. legally, yeah. and I think we're getting a little off the rails on that. We are, we are and, and I'm bringing it back. I'm bringing it back. Thank you. I totally agree with you. And so um, I don't have any other proponents or opponents that I know of, so I'm going to close the public hearing okay. and move into discussion uh, or any other, any other questions of staff right now. Okay? Any discussion? Yes, Councillor Patton. Um, if I may, one of the reasons why I'm advocating for this move is, A, because it speaks true to what the original language was for this, and it has been common kind of practice for the council to pull funds from SDCs because they, when at all possible, because they are more restricted than the general fund money. By doing so, it gives the parks folks more, essentially more wiggle room, because if something were to come up in the interim and they would need that $150,000 to do something that maintenance wise or <clears throat> heavens forbid, a, you know, a bathroom explode or something like that happen, they would be able to pull that money from the SDC funds. They'd have to pull it from these general funds. And so 
that that's one of the big reasons why I'm, I'm I'm not trying to usurp anything that the that the parks board is doing. If anything, the spirit of my my motion is to try and give them more leverage and more wiggle room by making sure that this money is paid from SDCs, which are which is this is one of the few times that the city actually can use SDC funds to pay for these sort of things. So that's why I'm making that motion. No, nope. fair explanation. Yes, Councilor Davis. Um, I'd like to speak against the motion and go with the staff recommendation. I mean, we hire professionals to make recommendations for us. We have a chief financial officer who behind the scenes has to review uh, constantly the budget and where the money's gonna come from. We have a city administrator who reviews that with the chief financial officer and brings those recommendations to us. We're not, I am not here on a daily basis nor do I want to do their work. Therefore, I'm gonna speak, uh, I'm gonna vote no against the motion. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other discussion? So, to revisit the, um, so we had, a, so resolution 1379, where the motion's been made actually, to move to direct staff to bring back to council amended language to allocate funds from SDCs at a date Certain in the future is the motion. It's been seconded by Council President Endley. Any discussion from here? I'd like to speak to the motion if I could. Yes, you may. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I I second the motion for a reason. I'm, um, well, I seconded it because I didn't make it. Um, I can totally agree with Councilor Patton's assessment that there are limited areas that we can use SDC, SDC funds in, and this is one of them. We can always use the general funds for SDC purposes, but not the other way around. And this was the way it was brought to us, so I wanna stay true to our original vote. And um, also, it, I know that Councilor Pavin wanted to get this done tonight and that can't happen, but I think that also, um, we have two councilors that aren't here tonight that would like to probably weigh in. And so I just, I feel like passing this motion tonight to move it over would at least allow the discussion to continue. More information to come from Eric, and um, so I, I would support this motion. Okay. Maya, is Councilor Bangs weighed in on anything, or? He's unable to use the chat feature at this time, oh, okay. um, but I, we have been in communication via text at least. Okay. There's been nothing yet. Okay, thank you. All right, any other, so um, all those in favor of um, the motion on the table? Aye. Aye. Um, anyone opposed? Aye. I just saw Councillor Bang's uh, hand flash up. For, For which way? <laughs> sorry. I went, I went he has to, to use the chat now. I went too quickly. <laughs> Councillor Bangs, can you please uh, text my phone? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to read into, I have a text from him that says yes. Yes. <laughs> so yes I assume that that's a yes vote. Okay. To the motion. To uh, the should zone. we clarify, please? Mm -hmm. Maya. I, 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 mean, I yeah. can. Cause, because, I mean, to be fair, Jim said I to the nay, if you yeah. will. So I just yeah. want to be yeah, certain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it says I vote yes. Okay. So yeah. there we go. Okay. So that motion to table it to a date certain in the future with language about the SDCs passes. Do we need to set the date? Yeah, now? is that date certain? Um, it's uh, as a matter of convenience. Would it be to that have a little more time to chat with them after his vacation? Um, yeah, it, if if you would like to set a date certain, of course. But I mean, this is something we're going to need to do anyway. So I would I would just tell you that How I would about bring a date it back. to be determined. Yeah. At, at the earliest opportunity, I will bring this back to you, unless you want to set a date certain. I was going to say, I think we made the motion yeah. to set the date certain. Date yeah. certain in your little blurb? The motion was to yeah. set the date certain, so we need Correct. to set a date certain. Okay. okay. Then let's, then okay, I guess, the yes, I did say that in my motion. You don't want it at the next meeting in two weeks? You want to go out no, for it? He, he needs more time. That would be helpful just to make sure we've got, again, just want to follow um, the just want to follow the spirit of what the council is asking me to do, and I want to also make sure that we're doing all this properly within the the budget law. So the next, the, so not the first. You you're looking at March 15th. Is March 15th enough time to yes. do that work and bring it back? Yes. 
then thank you for a date to be determined that date being the 15th of March okay all, all we're good with date and it's passed wonderful <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Council. You're welcome, I guess. Four to one. Okay. Next up is our second public hearing for this evening, the public hearing regarding the parks maintenance fee. Uh, again, um, the matter presently before the hearing body requires a public hearing. Um, all parties in attendance shall be heard on the matter. An opportunity was given to sign up to provide testimony, and so far no one has signed up to speak on the topic or has submitted comments or testimony regarding the hearing for the park's maintenance fee. Uh, a decision shall be made by the hearing body at the close of the hearing, or the matter will be continued to a date certain in the future, and this will be the only notice of the date you will receive. Um, any questions on this matter? Not seeing any. So, um, so we'll go to the staff report, which will be presented by um, the city attorney. Questions by the hearing body, and then I will open up public hearing for testimony from proponents and opponents, each being <coughs> three minutes each. I will then close the public hearing. Again, any further questions, and then discussion. I have a question after the staff report. Okay, so th this yes. is a situation where uh, we were asked to bring back the potential uh, sunset clause attaching to the uh, park maintenance fee. And it just so happens that it was easier and more in line with how fees are usually um, uh, operate or, or given operation, which is uh, by resolution, to instead of going back and trying to reamend the old ordinance. The old ordinance had a sunset provision in it that killed the whole program. This, and so you'd have to go back and unamend or reamend the whole ordinance and then it would have to go through the ordinance process. And then it wouldn't have with it a, necessarily a public hearing. And so fees should really have a public hearing. So in this respect, we're changing a fee. We're actually doing it, the, the uh, way we're doing it operatively is by resolution. And then therefore, you can always change that resolution, but what this does is it bakes in that date certain as of what it would have been before, which is December 31st, 2027. And you can always come back and change it, but when you change it, you, it will take another public hearing. And what I was hearing from the some of the, um, conjecture of the of the board was that they thought that the last time it it was changed by ordinance and therefore didn't have that public hearing element to it because it didn't change the fee it removed an expiration of that fee and this this way it will have to change the fee and so therefore we'll always have to come back for public hearing when you go to change it if that makes sense and and it doesn't have to go through first second and then 30 days it would be operative the, the second you vote for it. Okay. Councilor Mark. Yeah, so make sure I understand you correctly. Is tonight's public hearing, if we approve this resolution, adding the expiration date back into it, do we still need to bring another public hearing after tonight, or is tonight's public hearing appropriate to add the expiration date? T tonight's public hearing is just only to add the the expiration date because okay. the fee should not be any different than it is right now. Right. So we would have to have a different public hearing if we changed the fee, but not the expiration date. Yeah. And, okay. and currently the fee has baked into it a uh, indicator that always goes up the CPI. Correct. So, um, so it changes ev every July one, I believe. Yes. When, it gets, yeah. yeah. It gets Automatically, it's redone the budget. So, so in that case, Mr. Oh, Mayor, oh. I move to approve resolution 1380, well, a resolution. We have to have yeah, we have to do the public hearing yeah. piece first. We did not on Thank the last you. one, but that's okay. Oh, and we'll, let me be more clear. So, when it does change, we also do a public hearing because we always change it as part of our fees schedule changing anyway. So, you know, when we always change our fees. So we try to do that piece of it at that moment too. So there would also be another opportunity and that's more about the price. 
So if, if we, as part of the budget process, when we do our fee schedule hearing, you would also have that opportunity to say, well, let's cap it. I think we capped it one year because of COVID. So we didn't, we didn't have any indicator. So as an example, just well, so I give you all to, the information. In order to stay on the appropriate way, I will reserve the motion, but uh, just know that I am ready and prepared to make okay. a motion when it is time. Scott, did you have something? No? Okay. Okay. Anything else, Joe? Not if you don't have any questions. Questions? Uh, of staff on this at all? Nope. Okay. I'm going to open up the public hearing then regarding the change to the park maintenance fee. I don't think there's any yellow cards that have come our direction either for or against that. Okay. Um, I will then close the public hearing. Any other questions? Nope. Um, Wait. Maybe. Discussion? Oh, no. I'm for, no. When we get to discussion, I'll ask. Discussion. Well, We're there. Oh, it's, oh, it's, 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 Mr. Yeah. Mayor, I move to approve resolution 1380, a resolution implementing an expiration date to the current park the maintenance discussion fee. Discussion is part of the hearing. Discussion is after the motion and second. Okay. No second. Did, did you, you finish your motion? You I have finished the motion? the motion, yes. I'll second the motion. Okay, motion has been made to approve resolution 1380, a resolution implementing an expiration date on the current park maintenance fee. Discussion. Okay. Uh, I will just reiterate what I said last time. I do not think it makes any sense to sow doubt in the funding mechanism for our parks department by putting a sunset on it that isn't tied to creating a permanent taxing mechanism. It does not provide stability for the projects that the parks folks are trying to accomplish, in my opinion. Uh, it, to me, hinders the ability for staff to hire quality candidates because they don't know if the money that's going to pay their paycheck is permanent or if it will be gone in five years. Um, and so I, I, I am not, I am fine with having it sunset at some point in time, but for it to sunset with something that actually means that the parks will be funded. And that is my thought on that. And I'm sorry, Gordon, I did unmute myself. So I'm saying it again. Okay. I'm done. Thank you, sir. Any other discussion items? Yes, Councilor Davis. I speak in favor of the motion. Uh, back when this was originated and created, um, the citizens, I was sitting in the audience and the citizens were promised that this would come up every five years when it was created by the city council at that time. This also then came back to the Park and Rec Committee and the Park and Rec Committee uh, voted uh, I believe it was uh, eight to one or nine to one in favor of keeping it sunsetted uh, at that point. And staff recommendation at the time was also to keep the sunset in place. Uh, therefore, uh, nobody's talking about eliminating any park positions in the future. We all know that we need park positions and we'll budget for those accordingly. So that's why I speak in favor of the motion. Any other discussion? Okay. I'll just say that we can't on one resolution say we should follow how we voted, and then on the next resolution say we shouldn't follow how we voted. So that's that's all I want to say to that. Okay. All right. There's no other discussion. Um, all those in favor of um, of this motion? Aye. 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 Wait. It's to remove the sunset. What? No, the it's sunset to, is to, to, to add it's, the five years. No, it's to add it. Add it's it back in. Add Aye. It. Okay. Yes. I wanted to make sure we were right and voting mm -hmm. the right way. I yeah. vote to put it. And my Councilor Banks is also voting aye. He's vo uh, voting no. He's voting no. And okay. I would be a nay as well. Okay. So that motion passes three to two. Okay. So we will. That's it. That's, That's it on that. Okay. okay. Takes okay. care of resolutions for the evening. Choppy, but we got there. Here we go. <laughs> New business this evening. Um, consider approving the Canby Depot Museum Local Register of Historic Resources application. And Scott, we have Jamie Sickle will uh, will present. Good evening again, uh, Jamie Stickle, Economic Development Director. And um, I have a presentation as well as um, Carol Palmer who is presenting on behalf of the applicant. Yes, 
Thank you. And so, yes, before us this evening is the Historical Protection Overlay Zone designation for the Canby Depot Museum. Just a second. Okay. Okay, I think it should let you know. <clears throat> oh, okay. I'm going to put it on. Thank you. It works. Thank you. Okay. Um, so tonight, as an overview, I uh, will provide the applicant request and background, um, the criteria for the historic landmark and historic desig er, district designation, um, as well as city staff recommendation. So the applicant request, the city received an application from the Canby Historical Society to include the Canby Depot Museum, which is located at 888 North East 4th Avenue to the local register of historic resources. Um, the city council approval this evening would result in the historical protection overlay zone designation as outlined in Canby Municipal Code 16.110.045. So um, before us this evening is not whether or not to put it on the local register, but whether or not to designate it with the historical protection overlay zone. The Heritage and Landmark Commission um, is it possible to close that so I can see the... Um, I think if you were to make... Oh, the close the Zoom window. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the His Heritage and Landmarks Commission approved the application at their uh, December 5th public hearing. That recommendation was for staff to forward the application to the Planning Commission and the City Council for approval. The Planning Commission approved the historical designation on January 9th of 2023. And at that time there was a um, robust discussion. Commissioner Calkins originally moved to approve the historical protection overlay zone designation only if it was possible that the depot museum could be moved downtown um, and based on their current location zoning. So the zoning for the location over where it sits on 4th Avenue is um, light industrial. The applicant indicated at that time that they would withdraw their application should the commission move forward with that motion as, as proposed. And so the motion that um, ultimately was approved was um, that the chair moves to approve a recommendation to place the Canby Historical Society Depot Museum on Northeast 4th Avenue on the local register of historic resource, resources with a request to city council looking forward in the future to site the depot more centrally in downtown as opportunities present themselves. Um, I wanted to bring up a slide um, from our Canby Municipal Code 16110075 um, that specifically speaks to moving or the demolition of a historic resource, a, a contributing resource or a landmark. Um, and the, the purpose of this code is just to address and, and put some protections in place for the resources that we have. There's a process that includes an application, notice, public hearing, those kinds of things. And um, in 20, 2014, the Mac House was moved from Southwest 2nd Avenue to South Knott Street. So the, while the, um, the board of the Heritage and Landmark Commission has changed greatly, um, the city itself has a history in the not so, uh, well now it feels very far away, 10 years ago, but um, in the not so distant past where um, a resource was moved. Um, go, moving into the background, the Historical Society held a neighborhood meeting uh, Tuesday, November 1st for property owners located within 500 feet and the purpose of this meeting was so that anybody, whether it was those property owners or someone who saw the public notice, could come and ask questions um, as far as the proposal was concerned. The Canby Depot Museum is eligible for the local register of historic resources due to its association with early development of Canby as a shipping and distribution center on the Southern Pacific's mainline link from Portland to California. California, and it brought economic f flexibility, opened markets for shipping local crops and goods, and increased the number, number of permanent residents in the city. The, the town literally grew around the, the depot as it was situated downtown. Um, some background, in 1870, the Oregon and California Railroad and the filing of the town plat um, led to the construction of the rail depot. Fall of 1891, a windstorm toppled that structure, which forced which forced the Southern Pacific Railroad to build a replacement, and that was completed in 19, er, 1892. Um, Canby continued to grow, and Southern Pacific responded on multiple occasions to update or enlarge the facility. 
um, including but not limited to in 1911 when 20 feet was added to the warehouse portion of the depot for people and goods. Um, and then Western Union and the Railway Express was also there and remained in operation until 1976. In 78, Southern Pacific offered to donate the building to the community and Mayor Robert Rapp appointed an advisory committee and um, work began. So the city council passed resolution uh, 252 to declare the history, the, the depot a historic site, um, but that resolution did not put that on the local landmarks list. Um, so the only, the only stipulation from Southern Pacific was that the depot be removed from their property in a timely manner um, by a professional moving company. In 1983, the depot moved from Northwest First Avenue to its current location, um, and it's situated um, a perpendicular to the railroad tracks on a concrete foundation. And one of the things that I think is kind of interesting is when we talk about historic resources, um, a good rule of thumb is that 50 years is, is historic, or, or there's there's historic tendencies properties there. And so we're, we're coming up on fairly soon, um, we'll be at, um, 50 years of the depot being in the location that it has been in currently. Um, a community group rehabilitated the deteriorating structure and repurposed it to become a museum. And those renovations include interior and exterior renovations, including new roof, painting, addition of the bathroom, lowering the warehouse floors, among others. Um, a grand opening event was held on October 6th of 1984. Um, the criteria for the, her or the historic landmark and heritage and historic district designation. So I wanted to just pull, because this is not something that we see all the time, I wanted to pull the language specifically from the code that speaks to this. So um, 16110040, Register of Historic Landmarks and Historic Districts. Um, it speaks to the Heritage and Landmark Commission shall maintain a register. Um, the three stru structures that had been designated under the the ordinance 742 were added to that register um, and the designated historic landmarks and historic districts shall have historical protection overlay zones applied to them unless the city council finds the zoning not appropriate to a specific piece of property. Um, 16110 or speaks to the designation procedure for historic landmarks and historic districts. So after review, notice, and public hearing, um, the Heritage and Landmarks Commission makes a designation or a decision on the city's historic landmark or historic district designation. Um, they shall also make a recommendation to the Canby Planning Commission and City Council for assignment of the, the historical protection overlay zone. And upon receipt of the record, of the Heritage and Landmarks Commission proceedings and recommendation of the Heritage and Landmarks Commission, Planning Commission conducts a review of that record and shall make a recommendation to the City Council for that designation, which is why we're before you this evening. Furthermore, um, 16110055 um, speaks to the criteria for something to be considered a historic landmark or his, a, to receive a historic district designation. Um, and it speaks specifically to that there is a historical, architectural, or environmental significance. So the historical significance um, is the association with the life, activities, events, um, the, the cultural, political history that is associated with that if it's listed on the local register of historic places. And um, the applicant provided information on the historic integrity as well as the historical significance that is attributed to the Depot Museum. So it was it was created as a number 11 combination depot. It's a rectangular structure with a wood frame. It's very standard for that kind of, it, you know, they made um, only so many of those over time. <clears throat> the building's clad in horizontal board siding composed of cedar. Exterior trim boards are placed over the siding. Um, the, the windows are 12 over four double hung windows and the original windows were replaced with vinyl windows, but a, one of the original windows hangs in the Depot Museum. So if you were there looking for information or looking through their photo display, you could see one of the original windows um, and it, it, on display there in the museum. The removal of the warehouse um, returned the building to its pre-1911 uh, footprint. And um, while the alteration of how the depot is situated as far as the railroad is considered, the integrity of the structure is um, characterized as adequate. 
The Southern Pacific Railroad Depot is eligible for listing on the local landmark register for its association with the early development, as I spoke to earlier, as a ship, um, and which helped to, you know, really situate Canby as a shipping and distribution center on the Southern Pacific uh, Main Line. The railroad brought greater economic flexibility, open markets for shipping crops, goods, and in the City Council Resolution 252, Myra Weston described the depot as the heart of the city which has grown up around it. Passengers from Portland to San Francisco um, and points between, uh, I'm sorry, and points between and beyond bought tickets and boarded trains at the depot. And so um, incoming mail was received and just uh, dispatched from there for Canby and rural post offices in this vicinity. Innumerable tons of products of the area's productive soils were shipped out of Canby and merchandise was received there for firms in the area until all motor vehicle, uh, until the motor vehicle superseded the steam and later the diesel train. So for almost nine decades, the depot was the focal point of the community's commercial core and a foundational element of its agriculturally based economy. I'm not going to read all of this text, don't worry. <laughs> um, it, the, it was vital to the economic development of the area that, ex, um, that extended from Louisiana to California. And the association, it had an association with a long list line of civic leaders, inc inc including Myra Weston, who um, co-owned the Canby Herald and served as the <coughs> president of the Save the Depot Committee. <coughs> the depot's Association with Herman Bergman, the station's agent from 58 until 1976, adds to its historic significance. Um, he was an advocate for saving the structure and repurposing it as a museum and served as the um, museum director for about two decades. And the historic significance is embedded in its connection to two families that shaped Canby's pre-1900 development, which is the Lees and the Knights, many uh, you know, the schools. Uh, some of our mayors have been Lees and Knight, uh, and Knight families. Um, Philander Lee sold 111 acres of his, his don donation land claim to the Oregon and California Railroad. And um, there was a provision in the sales agreement that required the firm to build a depot. So, you know, we talk all the time now about planning for the future, and it's great when we start to look back and we can see the ways that our forefathers planned for the development that we see today. Um, furthermore, the, the Knight family had um, many sons that were um, instrumental in transforming the community, um, anywhere from a pharmacy, a mill, blacksmith, um, they, they, were, they helped to uh, create Canby as we know it today. Um, and as I mentioned, um, serving as mayor, city recorder, the history is, isn't just in the tangible buildings and roads, but also um, in how the, the formation of the the city took place. It is staff's recommendation that the city council approve the historical protection overlay zone designation for the Canby Depot Museum as outlined in the Canby Municipal Code 16.110.045. And um, I will turn it over to Carol Palmer and then if you have any questions of me, I'm happy to step back up here. First of all, thank you for um, giving the Canby Historical Society this opportunity. Um, I'm Carol Palmer. I'm a Canby resident. I'm a member of the Historical Society. I have a degree, in, a PhD in history. And I think it's important that I tell you that we've got two members of the board here with us tonight, Nora Clark, who is the president of the Canby Historical Society, and Ken Daniels, who is the vice president. And so I thank them for being here. And if I stumble on anything, they'll help me out, I'm sure. Um, are we ready? Yeah. Okay, next page. I'm gonna skip through some of this. Jamie has already really talked a lot about what was in the application in terms of the criteria and the process. You can go to the next page. Do you wanna just, there's a clicker. clicker right there. <laughs> Which one do I click? The right arrow. Oh, there it is. Okay, cool. Um, so I just summarized for you, what's the criteria? What's the process? And then the current list of who's, which houses are on the, or which properties are on the current list, and when did they go on the list? 
Next, timeline. For, if you just needed it, I put in a timeline from 1869 to 1984 that shows you what different times when things happened. And I, again, Jamie talked to most of that, so I won't repeat it. Because the Planning Commission had a question about why is the depot located where it's located, mm -hmm. I thought it might be helpful to just run you through what happened back in 1978. The county actually deeded the current site to the city, and the purpose was for the depot. The county was act actually volunteered and jumped in to help the city with the whole get the depot and save the depot effort. Um, almost immediately, the folks who were working on the ground said, mm, this is not going to work, not a good site. Um, so they instantly started looking for other sites. And over the course of four and a half years, looking at probably at least a dozen sites, they finally in 1983, I'm sure with Southern Pacific breathing down their back, said, we got to get the depot out of here and we've got to move it. So they went back to the current site. So that's where it is now. And that's how that happened. I thought it might be more important to talk about why is doing this important? What does it mean for the community and what does it mean for the property owner? So any property, um, actually preservation is that, that's the whole thing is we're trying to preserve the property. Um, and how does that happen? What does the property owner have to do? All proposed alterations are subject to design review. So they have to go to the um, planning commission or planning department where the planning uh, uh, director determines if it's a minor alteration or a major alteration. And the whole impact or the whole thinking around that is how is this alteration going to impact the historic integrity of the property? So um, you would think that a uh, roof replacement and these are two examples of things that the Canby Historical Society has actually done. You'd think a roof replacement would be a major project. Well, it is a major project, but in this particular case, it had the roof that was being replaced was not historic. It wasn't even the same material as the original roof. Um, the whole uh, project was designed in such a way so that nothing happened except for the roof itself. So we had black shingles going on top, replacing black shingles. It was like for like. So the whole project did not impact the appearance, the footprint, or the profile of the building. So that is what I would call a minor um, alteration. Just basically good standard maintenance. The window replacement, on the other hand, those windows were original. There are products, techniques, and professionals in the, in the uh, marketplace that can actually extend the life of original windows. Um, so replacing them with vinyl was indeed a major alteration, and that would have needed to go before the Heritage and Landmark Commission for approval from that body. Um, I think this is important for the community because the public hearing that the Heritage and Landmark Commission holds, people get to come and give their opinion and talk about either uh, pose or, or, as you well know, uh, support. And also there is an appeal process. So if they don't like the um, answer that they hear, they can, you know, take it higher. Um, next slide. That's me to do that. <laughs> Got it. Um, one of the really, really important things from the property owner perspective is a historic landmark designation opens access to grants that are restricted to designated properties, or it provides a competitive advantage when applying for non-restricted grants. Old buildings are money pits. Culturally raised, uh, based uh, nonprofits are always financially strapped. So if we're going to preserve that building, anything we can do to give the Canby Historical Society an advantage in the grant market is a good thing. Um, good example locally again, Mark Prairie School, big, big damage in the ice storm, $600,000 worth of damage. Uh, $400,000 is being covered by insurance, but the other $200,000 they're having to uh, you know, fund. Um, that is a designated property. It's outside of the city limits, so it's designated by the county. They have so far been able to raise uh, from some pretty big grants over $100,000. So they're 50% of the way to getting that fully paid for. Next one. Um, one of the reasons that granting organizations like designated properties is because they know that there is design review, review and that their investment in the property is going to be overseen for the, for the, not only today, but for the future. And part of the reason they really like designations is because a state Supreme Court ruling in 2016 um, said that um, 
designation lasts for the life of the structure, even after ownership change. So if I'm a granting organization, that tells me that I'm, you know, the property I'm giving money to is again going to be preserved, at least reviewed before it's something bad happens to it. Um, the Lake Oswego Preservation Society um, sued the city of Lake Oswego for uh, the city of Lake Oswego Heritage and Landmark Commission had agreed that an, uh, one of the heirs to a property could remove their designation. That was appealed to the city council. They upheld, appealed to Luba, which also upheld, appealed to a uh, court of appeals, upheld, and was overturned by the state Supreme Court. Um, if the can question is, okay, so what happens to, in Canby, if the Canby Historical Society dissolves, the collection, according to their bylaws, will go to the Clackamas County Historical Society, but the property reverts to city ownership per the deed. Um, public structures, because at, the, at that time, because it's a public structure, SHPO would have to approve anything that the city would decide to do with it. But the problem with that, with that particular um, uh, Oregon Revised Statute is that it doesn't allow for community input and it doesn't allow for uh, an appeal process. So um, it is better to have the designation than it is to have that state statute. Um, one of the reasons it was important for um, for Nora and for myself and for most of the members of the Cambia Historical Society was we wanted to establish an accurate and complete record of the structure's history. So this gives us a way to create an official record. As you may know, there are some conflicts in the general history of the, the depot. And so it was really important that this be done very carefully. Um, so my research guidelines was were to use all the primary resources I could. Anytime I, I could find a primary resource, I went there. Um, double source on conflicting information. Those are all the places where I went. Um, and then the really important thing was footnote, footnote, footnote. When I did the, um, the application for the city hall, I did not do footnotes. I just put in a bibliography. But because of the controversy, because of the conflict, it was really important that anybody could go back to that application that I submitted, see those footnotes, and trace the research I'd done. And what did we find out? We found out that indeed the depot is a Southern Pacific standard design number 11 combination depot. It was constructed in 1891-92. It is not the oldest depot in the state of Oregon. It probably never has been. Um, also really interesting, something I wasn't expecting to find is that um, our history of the railroad and the depot, the, sort of the popular history of it, is fairly shallow in that it overlooks or minimizes people, actions, and events that were critical, in some cases transfer transformational in terms of the evolution of the community. Um, I was a couple of times just reading things and thinking, wow, how do we not know this? This is really important stuff. Um, so hopefully I've included those things in the application. Um, and then uh, one of the things I wanted to mention is that the amount and quality of the primary source material in the depot collection is truly remarkable for a small community museum. Um, it is very common that you would go through vertical files in a museum, a, a city museum, and you'd see lots of newspaper clippings and some material um, that is not, is, is more primary source type. Um, but in the depot, it's really very different from that. And there's one page in here where I talk about all of the things that the city went through during that 1978 to 83 period of uh, the, deep, the work with the county, those sorts of things. And every one of those footnotes is a, a city document that is held at the depot. So because it was at the depot and because I wanted to do my due diligence, I did call Melissa to see if I could find if there was any, vol any of that information, which was basically city documents, staff reports, memos, correspondence, if that was anywhere in this, the city files, because I know that you've got a great uh, storage room there with uh, lots of good information in it. And it turns out the city doesn't have any of these records about what happened during that period. At least they were not easily found if, if you do have them. So anyway, one of the really good reasons to preserve this structure is it means preserving the collection. That's all I have. Okay. Your Honor, just so you know too, uh, Councillor uh, Maldonado has been able to now participate. He's on. Wonderful. Great. 
Thank you both for, did you want to come back up, Jamie? You were, point, you were pointing at me like you no, wanted I to. I was trying to quietly signal and see if I should come back up here, but now oh, I, I got you. Um, <laughs> and in the packet, there is a recommendation, uh, not, not only the recommendation, but also a proposed motion. Perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. And Carol, uh, thank you very much. As always, I do appreciate when you come and present and thank you to the historic, uh, Kimmy Historic Board for being here as well. Um, any comments or questions for on, on the proposed idea for this evening? Yeah, thank you guys for that presentation. Carol, I, I always leave your presentations smarter. So thank you for uh, <laughs> presenting. Um, yeah, she knows so much. And uh, Canby is, is lucky to have you. Um, and the historical uh, committee as well. So thank you guys for being here. Uh, my, my only concern on it is the comment by the Planning Commission of moving the building. Is that... That's not something the historical society wants to do. Is, am I correct? That's. I'm not going to say that. I think no, it is a bad location. That's my opinion. But um, it's just. I'm not going to say what opposed or uh, supporting, but just. Is this the right time? I, I, you know, I, I I had some concerns. I was very concerned because, as I understood the rest, of the uh, Chris Cockins. Um, proposal was that it would be <clears throat> contingent that we could only get the historic designation if we could move the building, yeah, move <laughs> and that just made me feel like we were trapped. So and, I mean, there's so we don't have. So there's not there's not plans or or no, a, a future no. look at moving it. And I imagine if it took us four years in 1980 something to find that location, it probably would take us. A much longer time now to find a, a different location. So, okay. and Councilor but, Barway, but moving is not off the table. You just you didn't want a contingent on that. Yeah, and that was yeah. going to be my next question yeah. of if we if we do offer this and and pass this resolution, does that restrict us in the future from moving it? Then I'm hoping that that answer is no. It's no. That's okay. what I was going to answer too. Is just looking at uh, Jamie read part of that. 16110045G. It, it basically says you shall conduct a review of the records and then you shall vote either to approve, deny, or you can approve subject to modifications. So you can go ahead and modify that if you don't, if, if, if there's language that seems friendlier to you in, in regard to how movement in the future would go, uh, you guys could suss that out tonight um, or you could just. Follow staff recommendations yeah. and approve. Yeah. I don't, I don't think we need to set that out tonight. I, I think, yeah, I'm, yeah. Okay. I, I was just that with with two planning commissioners having mentioned that. It, I just wanted to kind of get the clarification on like, is that something that's been in the conversations, you know, should, that we should be aware of? But, so thank you for those clarifications. Yeah, the um, motion got amended after I said I was going to um, withdraw the owner approval or the owner, you know, yeah, the owner approval, um, and and I was fine with the revised motion. So that's. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Padden, and then I'll go to the online group. So, fantastic presentation. Love it. All for it. Oh. Yes, my oh, there you go. <laughs> fantastic presentation. Love it. I'm all for saving the history of the city. Quick question. May I be excused for a moment? Yes, you may. Okay, thank you. I'll be right back. <laughs> well, we, and we don't lose our quorum because we got it. Yeah. <laughs> I've never been asked for permission to leave the dais before, so that's good. Um, uh, did Councillor Bangs have? Uh, it was Maldonado. No, I, I see his uh, hand up. Right. Councillor Maldonado. Okay. Uh, Councillor Maldonado, you had a comment? Uh, yes. And uh, Sean, actually, or Councillor Varwig actually uh, asked the same question I was going to ask. I would love to see it. Uh, in a more centralized location. I think that would be phenomenal for the citizens of Canby to be able to really gather in, in an area where it's at more than uh, where its current location is. Um, other than that, I just wanted to say absolutely great job, ladies, on the bountiful information that you've given us tonight. Thank you. So again, by passing this, this just does not prevent us from moving it in the future. Of course. Of course. Okay. 
Well, then, Mr. Mayor, I would like to make a motion to approve the historical protection overlay zone designation for the Canby Depot Museum located at 888 Northeast 4th Avenue as outlined in the Canby Municipal Code 16.110.045. Ms. Dockett. What page is that motion on? 67 of 132. Do you want to just read that screen? I'm sorry, what page? One, uh, page 67. What are we waiting for? It's the last of the staff report. Thank you. Over there. Thank you. So the motion has been made by Council President Hensley and seconded by Councilor Maldonado to approve the historic protection overlay zone designation for the Canby Depot Museum located at 888 Northeast 4th Avenue um, out, as outlined in the Canby Municipal Code 16.110.045. Any other discussion? Not seeing hands going up anywhere. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Councillor Bangs says yes. Okay. Um, I guess, and, does he default uh, abstention? <laughs> well, <laughs> he did he say he was for it before he dashed out, but I don't think we can officially count that on the record. <laughs> you, you don't necessarily need to. <laughs> <laughs> he default abstains. <laughs> so we will say that the motion passes. Um, we have the designation of the overlay. Five Perfect. zeros, <laughs> one. <laughs> I was leaving that part out. Great. Uh, next up is a presentation of the Canby Hotel development analysis. And there's Jamie smiling. And I think it's a busy night for Jamie. Third time's a charm. All right. Good evening. Good so evening. Jamie Stickle, Economic Development Director, here to talk about the um, 2022 hotel development analysis. As background, in um, 2018, finishing up in 2019, the city of Canby worked with Johnson Economics to do a hotel analysis for Canby. Um, in previous years, in 2012, I believe, um, we had done an analysis that indicated at that time, in 2012, that there was no demand for for a hotel in Canby. But in 2018, um, the picture was quite rosier as far as hotel development comes. Um, and I think we, we started in on 2019 in a, in a very excited way. And then as we know, COVID hit and that changed the hotel game and the tourism game um, drastically. And so as we came out of COVID and started to take a look at the landscape and, and what Canby could still support, we went back to Jerry Johnson and asked him to, um, him and his team to uh, do an update, an addendum to that study. And so I'm actually going to turn it over to Jerry Johnson this evening so that he can present and, and provide an update on the hotel development analysis. Um, and I'll turn it over to Jerry. Great. Thank you. Good evening, Jerry. How are you? Hi. Thanks, Jamie. I'm sorry, I'm in Portland State right now. I was teaching a course until a little after 8 o'clock today. So um, we, um, we did, a, we, as Jamie outlined, we did the analysis back in 2017, 2018, at which point, you know, Canby had grown to the point and had enough population and business activity to, prop, to support a new hotel. And we were starting to get some decent um, response to that those materials, but when COVID hit, the hotel industry nationwide and locally um, had sort of a tough run at it. It's coming back, not quite back to the previous levels, but it's getting closer. Um, and so Jamie asked us to update it. Um, so we did that. The, um, I wish I had more slides with me. I'm trying to think. Um, I do have. Maybe I don't have. Let's see. Oops, where I get some basic data on the market, but um, the expectation right now is that um, this is not letting me do anything, anyways. Um, that we should be able to go out and solicit the things we basically collected data on your population, employment base. You've had a lot of good economic development news of late. We took a look at um, 
some of the patterns in some of the industries and in, uh, some of the hotels around here. We see the hotels actually did relatively well in Clackamas County vis-a-vis -vis the national average. Um, looking like we're starting to get some hotel interest again in the area. And so the hope is that we can capitalize on that, um, use the package of the new materials to as an outreach piece and hopefully to provide information to prospective developers. And um, you finally get a new hotel out here. It's been a little bit. And um, I think it's a good support service for your um, employers. It's great for your residents if people staying over. And um, the great thing about people who come to hotels is what they do when they stay at hotels is go out to your community, eat dinner, um, spend money, things that you are generally favorable with. So I am, um, let's see if I can get, I don't really have hard slides, Jamie. I don't know if you have much slides on this, but <laughs> I was, in my class, I don't have much on it. Um, most of the trend data actually puts us a little bit below where we were in the previous analysis, but certainly the trend is positive, so we're getting to the point where um, I think most of the developers can look forward and see how things are returning to normal, and um, we should get back to the same trajectory we're, trajectory we were on before the pandemic. Um, and I do not have slides on this, but I did include the hotel analysis in the packet. So that's there for you. And one of the things that we've already found, and maybe Jerry could speak to this, is that it's been incredible to have a document that has updated information that we can partner with the 2018 study that was completed. It, you know, to be able to show that historical data over time has been something that even in the, you know, some of the brief conversations we've had, um, whether that's with a potential developer, with our partners at the chamber, we've had a lot of conversations of just how do we make something like this happen and to be able to see that, you know, revisit those numbers and revisit those um, what would best fit here in Canby has been something that's been really powerful and I think will be powerful as a tool moving forward. And furthermore, the opportunity to be able to highlight the ways that Canby has grown over the last um, several years. You know, many cities did not fare as well as Canby. I'm not, I'm not saying that our businesses didn't struggle. They certainly did. Some of them continue to struggle to this day. But, um, you know, when we start to look at the industrial park, there were items that were underway at that time um, that finished up, things that got started during that time that um, weren't on the horizon. So when we did the study in 2018, one of the businesses that um, was a, a dream and now is a reality is Columbia Distributing. And so when we reached out to um, their director of communications and said, is this something that you would use if we had it in Canby? You know, their headquarters is in Wilsonville. They have, they have 300 employees here in Canby. They have 500 in Wilsonville. Um, so in a very, very small area, they have 800 employees. And you might think, well, then they're close to the Hilton Garden Inn in Wilsonville. But that's it's just simply not the case. They would love to be able to have people come out to Canby, keep them here, you know, give them an opportunity to stay close. And, um, and it was something that... I think, you know, whether you are thinking about where corporate travelers, travelers are, or like we heard from Clayton earlier, who was talking about our fair and rodeo and the events that happen at the fairgrounds over the year, the years, I'm sorry, over the course of the year, um, it's really, it's been a very powerful tool to be able to say, we could keep them here. And then, you know, if we all think about our family, obviously I would be happy to let my parents and my siblings all stay with me, but some people feel like maybe they'd like to have their family stay someplace else. <laughs> and so giving them opportunities to stay other places um, is certainly something that um, I think most people can understand. And in a case like taking a look at the study that was recently completed and, and the study that was completed in 2018, it's not just something that we can understand, it's actually something that could be a reality here in Canby. So, um, if you have any specific questions for, for Jerry or for myself, I'd be happy to answer. We are here just um, as a pre uh, to provide a presentation, give an overview, just so that you know that this is an item that we're working on. Um, but it's something that I think is extremely valuable to the community, whether that's business and property owners, residents, tourists, people that are even considering moving to Canby, they might think differently if we have all of the amenities that you would want in a, in a community this size. Um, 
Jerry, thank you for being here this evening. I appreciate it. We tried to stall as long as we could tonight for you to get out of class. So fortunately, we we were able to do that this evening. Um, when the the study was first done back not too long ago, um, I know that there were many of us in the council that thought that the idea of a hotel was necessary back then. And I think what we ran into was people in the hotel industry not believing that Canby could support um, the development of a hotel. Um, Canby is historically, it continues to be a unique city in where we sit. Um, there is a little bit of a uh, an island factor that I think Canby has and has had for a long time where I, I don't think that those kinds of things are something like that is in, taken into consideration. Um, we're not part of Portland. We're not part of Wilsonville. We are on the other side of the low hills of Oregon City, so we sit as a standalone entity that I think could have supported something then and even can more so now. So I think that the fact that we have revisited this, we continue to revisit this, we continue to drive this forward, because I know that this is something that the Chamber of Commerce has been on their strategic plan for since I was on that board um, back then. And so um, I'm glad that we keep moving this forward. So my question to you as our economic development director with this information, does this position us to be able to draw in some of the names that were listed in here, like a Holiday Inn Express yes. or a Hamptons, or are we looking at more of a private, smaller company that comes in and pulls a trigger on something like this? I think that this, I think that unequivocally, yes, it does. I mean, it, absolutely. It's, it gives us an opportunity to be able to recruit at a high level, whether that's a Hilton or at a local level that, um, you know, where someone might say, I have a dream and I want to do something like this and be an owner operator. But one of the things that I've learned in this short amount of time is that um, there, there's a lot of ways to get that done. And so sometimes even some of the hotels that we know and love, I can't remember the term, so Jerry might know it, but where you have a hotel that's called the, you know, the Stickle Hotel, uh, for example, and um, that that could be run with a shadow company attached to Hilton or attached to, uh, it's not shadow, that's not the right term, but do, do you know the term, Jerry? Well, I think what you're thinking, of, it's actually sort of a, a different concept with why you see a lot of the brands like a, a Hilton Garden Inn or something, a lot of times they're independently owned by smaller investors and what they've done is flagged, which is a negotiated deal that you cut with Marriott or Hilton or one of the things, and they have multiple chains or concepts that they have, and you commit to doing a certain level of quality or certain finishes or certain look and feel um, for a piece of your growth. They help you in the bookings, and you're part of their network, and to anybody coming in, you look like you are uh, you know, Holly and Express or whatever it is. Um, but it doesn't mean that Holly and Express the Holiday Inn actually owns the facility. It just means gotcha. that they flag the facility. And a, I mean, a great example of that is that, um, you know, the, the Motel 6 was formerly the Canby, I think, Canby Country Canby Inn. Canby. Yeah, Canby, yeah. And so, and that it's owned by the same comp or the same family still. But by becoming a Motel 6, they were able to tap into Motel 6 branding, Motel 6 website, Motel 6 reservations, yeah. and all of those systems in place, which makes it um, a, a stronger a, a stronger business model here in Canby. And furthermore, it really allows Canby to be on the, on the map as far as when you say, I'm going to be traveling and I always stay at a Motel 6, um, and then all of a sudden Canby pick, picks up. So it actually turns in almost to a branding. And the requirement... Um, of that hotel increased when it became a Motel 6 from how it was ran as the Canby, um, the Canby Country Inn because Motel 6 has a standard that they require. No, okay. that's perfect. Yeah. You had a question? Um, well, actually, yeah, kind of. I mean, we've done the analysis and then COVID, and now we're doing another analysis. So just to cut to the chase, clearly there's a market for this. Yes. How are we moving from 
yeah. analysis and stating, yeah, we need this to actively marketing it. What does that look like? And what are those next steps for you guys? So one of the things that's exciting that happened during the process of revisiting the hotel analysis or the hotel study was that there is a developer who um, actually an old real estate agent friend of his has a son that lives in Canby comes here often and he he recognized that there's no hotel in Canby. There's a Motel 6, but that's not necessarily what he had in mind. Over the course of his career, he was very um, focused on real estate development as it, uh, as it relates to hotels and motel development. So he contacted the developer and said, have you ever considered Canby, Oregon? Um, the developer has also reached out to the uh, Chamber of Commerce. He was here in October and attended the Chamber of Commerce luncheon, which was at Columbia Dis um, Distributing, which was great to have them on site to be able to see not just you know how great our industrial park is or how great our downtown is, but actually how great the community is. You know, the, it was a it's an excellent moving uh, uh, an excellent meeting to attend any day, but then to have it at one of our premier locations in the industrial park with the, um, with the room packed, I think it made quite the, quite the story. Um, uh, that gentleman, I think I met with him four times in a, in a week, um, and was able to connect him out further in the community, um, as, as opportunities or as questions came up, you know, including bringing, bringing in our, um, Director of Public Works of talking about utilities. How do we get utilities certain locations? Um, I don't think that all communities, Canby is not like any other community in the world, right? We can all agree to that and that's what we, we love about Canby. But the opportunity to be able to say, we've got questions about utilities and to call the person and they showed up at coffee and, you know, uh, had, had all the answers, much like he did with Arts and Parks earlier um, with that presentation. Um, <laughs> It, it, <laughs> it was, it's the kind of thing that shows that there's not just a demand, there's not just a need, but there's a community, a community here that's worth investing in and a community that will support that investment. Um, he recently came back, um, I believe it was the end of, or I guess two, two or three weeks ago. And, um, and he had, then he has also been working with other businesses that he knows and brought um, somebody that he works has worked with. Um, and it was great because we started talking and I said something about being from Yakima, Washington. And goodness gracious, I mentioned a hotel. He said, oh, it's this family, right? And I said, yes, I know them very well. He said, do you know this person? So it, apparently it's a very small world once you start to break into it. And, and um, it's it's time that Canby breaks into that world and, and gets a hotel. So. I also always say about things like this or just development in general, you never know when somebody knows somebody. Mm -hmm. And so part of getting the word out there was bringing Jerry tonight, talking about this, this pro, um, I'm sorry, the plan, talking with the Chamber of Commerce, working with this developer so that as we are all hopefully talking about where to house our, you know, in-laws and, and whoever else over the holidays that we're thinking about who do we know? Because you never know when someone's going to say, my friend developed a hotel in Yakima, Washington, and maybe they'll do so here. Well, you know, again, Jamie, I, I, you made the comment, I mean, my parents travel here from Cleveland. Mm -hmm. They've stayed in Wilsonville. They've stayed down in Woodburn. Um, and they keep asking. Yeah. They want to know because they'll stay in Canby if it's built. You know, so um, it's an exciting venture, and I, I'm glad that this brings us more information to get us moving closer to that. Councilor President Hensley, did you still have a question? No? Councilor Patton? I was stretching, sir. No, I would just like to say, you know, I remember back in like 2009 or whatever when I was first on council. Oh, sorry. Gosh, Gordon, I apologize. <laughs> uh, I remember back in like 2009 or whatever, when I was originally on council, we did one of these studies and it said that there can be wasn't ready and we couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. um, and so now it's nice to see the two studies say that it's time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if there's the land and there's the people willing to do it, I think that's I think that's great. Even back then, when the council was talking, we were talking not only hotels, but also maybe a city run campground. 
and those sort of things and really diversify the offerings that the city would have as far as as stays. So I'll just throw that out there. I think it's I think it's great that this time has come. <clears throat> Davis. Thanks, Jamie, for the presentation, and thank you for the partnership that you've had with the Chamber. Um, the Chamber has a tourism committee and as past president are on the board for the last six years. Uh, this has been our highest priority. We were very close uh, at the time of COVID, when COVID hit. We were getting very close to a hotel in Canby. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, when COVID hit, the hotel industry turned down. Uh, afterwards, we did contact Scott and Jamie and, and the Joint Tourism Committee from the Chamber of Commerce, uh, looking at what we can, what can we do to move this forward. Mm -hmm. And we also did some research. The Chamber did some research, research with Wilsonville, and uh, got some leads in Wilsonville uh, as well for additional type of hotels potentially that could go into Canby. And so with that, then we updated the study, and here we are today. And uh, we did talk about this at the goal setting, uh, at our, at our uh, goal setting as a high priority for the council. It is a, continues to be a high priority for our downtown businesses, as well as our industrial area and uh, Aurora Airport, Absolutely. with executives flying in all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and But our main business, of course, being the fairgrounds. And... Every time people leave there, you know, unfortunately, they're going somewhere else. And so something that will really revitalize and help our downtown businesses is this hotel, mm -hmm. you know, and so it has to be a high priority. Absolutely. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting is um, in this outreach, um, since the study has been completed, one of the people that I spoke with was the new, well, I don't know if he's new any, any longer. I think he's hit the one-year mark. So <laughs> relatively new executive director from the fairgrounds, Brian Crow. And um, we talked about how many people that the fairgrounds sees over the course of a year, which um, at that time he said roughly 200,000. But then the fairgrounds... Um, uh, an event center had actually has actually invested in some technology that allows them to to have a better sense of how many people over the course of the year go to the fairgrounds. That number is closer to three, I believe, it's between three hundred and three hundred and fifty thousand. That's a huge jump. Mm -hmm. When the study was completed, it was with the two hundred thousand number. So, the nice thing about having this tool that allows us to have the conversation. Having the conversation opens our eyes and the awareness of, well, actually, it's a lot more people that are coming through. And we think about the tournaments that come into town. Um, I was driving past, um, uh, on on Saturday, driving past Ackerman, and there was a, you know, a lot of activity. And, you know, I, I, I'm in the, the business of, like, breaking your neck as you're driving down the road. And I was, I was breaking my neck trying to look at exactly who was going in, in and out of that building, you know, and thinking, where are they going to stay? Hopefully, when they think about where they're going to eat, they come downtown. You know, we're talk, uh, we've talked a little bit, or you have talked a little bit about tolling and what the future of that looks like. And I, I just hope that some of those extra people have a reason to stop. And if you knew that there was a hotel in Canby versus having to go to Wilsonville or Oregon City, despite where you lived, you might actually have someone stay there. Um, I tend to think it would be more than just one person or just one family. So it's it's something that I think that is a it's a good a good um, item to work towards. I think having this study, I, I I'm never someone who thinks it's an, a good thing to do a study and then put it on a shelf. But having a study to be able to use as a tool to lure somebody that might develop is is something that is very, very useful because I can tell you all day long, well, we have lots of tournaments. The, the Clackamas County Fairgrounds and Event Center brings a lot of people. Our downtown is busy. Our industrial park is full. But to be able to have this study and the tangible document to be able to share, that is something that is is just absolutely worth it. And I'm already seeing and hearing that without having that updated study, it doesn't make as a compelling of a picture. So um, I, I was thrilled to be able to work on this and, and finish it up and work with Jerry again so that we could um, you know, move this forward and hopefully move forward towards the development of a hotel in Canby. Council President Hensley. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, this is the, the second analysis. And um, I think 
from what I'm hearing, you have the blessing here. You have support from us. Uh, what do you need from us? Uh, just a consensus of a blessing to go forth and recruit, or is there a, is there a, a policy point of motion we need to make at this point? No, it's just information. I was just going to say, since um, since the city at this point doesn't have a piece of property that would be something that would be developable in this, you know, when when we had um, the land where the Canby Civic Block is, that was a different story where there was a policy and there was a recruitment. Um, Taking the information that we have from this study or other studies, whether that's about the future of hotel development or the future of business in the industrial park, downtown, whatever it may be, that allows us to be able to um, accurately recruit, but also, that's just part of the work that we do is in economic development. Sometimes people will come to us and say, do you have land? Do you have this? Do you have, um, you know, are, do you know of a business? Do you know of um, investors? And so um, I think it's, it's another tool in our tool belt of the items that we already work on, which is that it allows us to have a better, more cohesive conversation with people as the interest comes. And then also, especially with the interest that we've seen in the last six months, it allows us to um, you know, continue those conversations. Um, but I think tonight, other unless there is a, um, unless if the city administrator has a different <laughs> viewpoint, I, I, really we just wanted to make it so that it was um, within your awareness for for what we have worked on and um, Excellent. one of the ways that we're recruiting business to Canby. Okay. Yeah. Before I turn it over to you, Scott, sure. quick question for Jerry and maybe even for you, Jamie. So when we talk about, so as Clay spoke to earlier, the, the event center and fairgrounds building a, a new building on their property um, there at the event center obviously expands the amount of activities that can be an event that can be done there at the event center, which was the whole goal to begin with, with, with that. Um, how does speculation on something like that expansion, or if the city were to expand into a, um, an at, a recreation complex with, you know, ball fields, is those move from conversations to reality or move down the pipe? How does that speculation play into a study like this? Or does it, it's just, that's great, it's great conversation, but until there's hard data, it's insignificant? How does that work? I think all these stories are significant. I mean, basically, can be the story um, many towns are, but you know, if you're on I-5, the story is easy because you fit normal underwriting criteria, as you noted, the island status of Canby. Um, the story is good, and if you just have more to it, it actually helps. I mean, people love the sports complexes for hotels. We worked on the one in um, Hillsboro, and then the hotels nearby. Um, because it fills up weekends, um, everybody wants booking nearby. If they're at a sports tournament, they don't want to drive back and forth from Wilsonville. They want to be close because they don't know when the next game is. Um, it helps, you know, move it around. Where most business travel tends to be, you know, Monday night through Thursday night. Um, a lot of these sort of complementary pieces, including the fairground, help you out in the weekends. And the big thing for most hotel operators are trying to get a distribution of demand that allows them to get their keep their occupancy relatively high throughout the year. And so all these events and growth in them, it's all great. It all adds to the story. And, I, and to further what um, Jerry is saying, I also think that, you know, it, the reason that we had reassessed the hotel um, demand in Canby over the years was because it, the demand for a long time said no, there isn't a, a any the the community cannot support that. Then when it finally turned, like we hit that tipping point that actually yes, it could support it. Then COVID hit. Hopefully, knock on wood, something like COVID does not happen again that then takes us back to maybe a starting block. So this refresher, adding the um, to the fairgrounds and event center or adding you know businesses or industrial park, additional residential, that only supports the demand as explicitly outlined in the hotel study, whereas COVID in many ways was um, such an unusual break in 
the way the, the tourism industry and travel um, overall worked. Uh, so so I, I would anticipate that we will use this, we'll show what, what was said in 2018, use the updated study to help recruit, and then hopefully, I mean, I, I would love to snap my fingers and have it in place tomorrow, but then what we would do is when we bring developers and we take them to the fairgrounds, check out this new building. This is what it can do. This is where they expect their um, their you know uh, reservations to come from, or or the kinds of events to be there. Um, this is what the industrial park looks like, and really use that as the building blocks to tell a cohesive story of what Canby has to offer above and beyond that. Whereas COVID was just such a a break in in in. The, the industry overall. Mr. Archer. Well, thank you, Mayor. It was just kind of an add-on to Council President Hensley's question about what what direction does Council need to give or whatever. I wanted to remind that when we had our goal setting session last week, this also came up. So when we bring back the, the goals, the updated goals for you to approve and kind of adopt, I think this is going to be part of it. And really what we're, I think Jamie said it well, but what we're just sort of looking for is that you know that that you're supportive of our of our efforts to do the city's part and what whatever that means that we can do the partnership you know with the chamber of commerce the general community the business community um, and of course you know working with any prospective developers that want to do this we're gonna we're gonna do everything we can but but also just sort of in a more formal way I think this is going to be captured in your goals from what we from what we talked about on Friday and and that's another one of those items that just adds to it's not just that we did the study but now that it's captured in the city's goals it's captured in the Chamber of Commerce's goals that again helps to tell the tell the story and sell the story hopefully good no. This is great. Great. Thank you. I Thank you all. It. Have a good evening. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Appreciate it. See you soon. Um, <clears throat> moving into mayor's business, I don't have much. Um, two things, really. First off, um, stay the city address. Um, I will be giving tomorrow evening at um, Cuts First Town Hall. That will begin at, uh, well, doors open at 6. Um, so please uh, come in, come down, um, invite all the council and city staff that want to attend. That'd be great. The other piece, I just and Scott had mentioned it that on Friday, the city council um, held um, an annual goal setting uh, conversation, and I appreciate all the work that was done on staff's part to get us ready for that, as well as the work and time put in uh, by the council. So I think we did a, a great job. Um, kind of, I think the goal was to kind of hone down on um, some items, and I think we did that. And so um, I'll be anxious to see what our facilitator reports back and um, get, you know, review that and get some more input from, um, you know, Councillor Bangs and Councillor Multinato, who kind of had to bounce in and out on, on the, that day or weren't able to attend. But um, it was all really uh, good work done, so I'm excited about that. So. Um, all my other stuff can wait until the next meeting because I have more meetings between now and then. So, giddy up. We'll start with council, uh, council comments and liaison reports. And we're going to start with Councilor Padden since he's here tonight. Okay. <laughs> well, I had a very busy week. So, I got back into town on Monday morning and I went to the school board meeting Monday night where uh, Mr. Silas Wood, a senior with Canby High School, gave a great report. Uh, some of the highlights were they're gearing up, the students are gearing up for finals, and many of the fall sports teams are going to state this year, so that is great. Uh, their CARE Award was, uh, this month's CARE Award was presented to Miss uh, Celine Gonzalez, who was with Caris, so that was really great to see. The industrial, something to call out, some things to call out, the industrial ed uh, group, has been doing a home building project. So the Canby School District has a number of um, building sites where the students actually build a house that's then sold to help fund the proceeds of the, to help fund the project. And I did not know this, but it has been in effect since 1972, yeah. which was really great to hear that that project's been going on for that long. 
Um, some operations things. Uh, not sure if people had noticed that there was a bunch of dumpsters and a bunch of activity around the schools a few months ago. They did their next round of furniture uh, change out at the at the school district, and so now they're about two thirds done with that. Um, they did their fall tree planting. Uh, new playground equipment went in at Lee, and they had zero injuries for the quarter, which is awesome for uh, operation of their size. Uh, progress is being made on their strategic plan. As I said, I love strategic plans. They're doing a five-year one, so kudos to them. Uh, they, they approved student transfers, which they hadn't done uh, last year, which set the Canby School District apart from others. And so now uh, for, they'll, be, they'll be accepting student transfers. And under public comment, uh, there's been some concerns regarding uh, reading comprehension with some of the younger students and um, getting folks involved in getting their kids to read outside of school. And I wasn't sure if maybe there was some sort of partnership that the city could have between our library and the school district to help drive that, uh, that reading outside of the school hours in our community. So that's something I'm going to be uh, looking into. Then Tuesday night, I went to the Canby Utility Board. That meeting was quite a bit shorter. Uh, they approved uh, some signature changes for their bank. They discussed a policy regarding the use of their community room. And while they did not get a grant for testing the Malala River water to deal with the dirt taste, uh, they are continuing to look for funding for that to, to try and get ahead of that. Uh, as for me, I just wanted to double check to see if there was any, um, <clears throat> at a previous meeting I had talked about doing a kind of like an org chart regarding the pool and the adult center for the school. So when they have questions into the main office, to the district office, you know, the pool is run by the city and city staff, but the uh, adult center is owned by the city, but run by a different group. And if that could be put together, that would be great. And then the last thing, and this is sort of a citizen thing that popped up. I've noticed some people complain about this online, and I got trapped uh, just yesterday on this. It seems that the, stop, the stoplight timing at the intersection of 99E and Northeast 4th Avenue or Pine Street is not correct. And if there's some way, there's apparently been quite a few people calling in on it. But if there's any way the city can put some backing to that, I think some of our citizens would be very grateful. And with that, that's it. Great. Thank you. Counts from Altonado. 99 and what? I, I, I had the privilege to finally meet up with the Bikes and Pedestrians Committee this week. Um, they, they did it on Monday instead of Tuesday due to the Valentine's Day. And I just got to say, this is a lively group. I absolutely enjoyed the heck out of being in that meeting. Uh, this time was for their goal setting. And they do have a few things to work out with their goal setting at this time, um, such as the how they want to address the extension on the logging road, and as well as public outreach as well for the uh, for their for their causes and their uh, and their plans for how they want to reach out for the logging road. Uh, other than that, I have nothing else to report. Okay, thank you, sir. Council President Hensley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was going to forego my report um, because I didn't really have a lot to report this time. However, I will answer to Councillor Pavin's concern that he saw online uh, regarding the traffic uh, signal timing on 4th and Pine as it has been brought up and discussed um, at the Traffic Safety Commission. And it apparently is not the only intersection that's affected and it's all due to the construction wonkiness of the timing of several intersections, ODOT's aware, and they will take care of it as soon as they possibly can. And to add to that, um, in a, ODOT has a signaling um, project underway where they are addressing sections of signaling as they go through and do uh, stretches of repairs and maintenance on roads and whatnot. And yeah. Canby is on that list to get some signaling work on Highway 99. If I remember, because Jerry already left, but if I remember correctly, that particular intersection, there was something that happened to the censoring in the construction process. And they have a repair they need to make, but they're aware of it. Okay. 
Councillor Varwick. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, the news is so fresh, you may not have even had the information yet for your report, uh, Councillor Patton, but uh, congratulations to Karis Principal Sam Thompson, who has been promoted to principal at Baker Prairie. That news came out today. Oh. Um, so I want to make sure to, to say congratulations there. Um, the Planning Commission um, met on Monday night. They had a light agenda. They really just did a work session on the comp plan, which uh, we will get that info coming up soon, I believe, as well. Um, so that's all I can report there. And Traffic Safety Committee is meeting for the first time in uh, a very long time okay. next week. I'm uh, sorry, uh, Transit Advisory Committee. <laughs> Transit Advisory. You said Traffic Safety earlier. And it was in my head. So and that is my report for tonight. Excellent. Councilor Bangs. Oh, I'm sorry. Maya, go ahead. I have a Councilor Bangs report. He attended the Heritage and Landmarks Commission meeting last Monday and has nothing to report from it. And the Library Advisory Board meets uh, next Tuesday. Great. Thank you, Councilor Banks. Appreciate it. He must hurt. I understand. Councilor Davis. Thank you. I'm used to being last. You need to start down there. Oh, no. I, because, of, because of that, next time, yeah. <laughs> I might even start in the middle of the dais one time. You never know. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. The citizens, uh, the Campbell Adult Center did meet. They're extremely excited about the lease. Uh, on the property being signed. And uh, so they thanked the, the city administrator and the city council for moving that forward and getting that signed. Now they can move forward with their uh, remodeled project. Uh, so then very quickly, I contacted the city administrator and him and I met with Kathy Robinson and members of the board. And we talked about the joint project. Uh, moving forward on the remodel for their facility. Uh, what does the, what is their responsibility? What's ours? Uh, we are getting some new bids uh, from Emmerich uh, on the remodel of that building and some architectural drawings, which has already been started with Kathy Robinson as well. So that's moving along uh, fairly rapidly. So they're excited about that. And thank you, Scott, for attending that. Um, also, uh, Parks Committee meets next week, the 21st. Sent a, my goal is to just send you guys minutes because they're working on so many things. I'm not going to cover all the items, but they are moving forward with all the items uh, uh, within their minutes that I sent you. And uh, because Jason loves uh, strategic plans, <laughs> I'm gonna pass you out. And I also, I sent uh, the electronic copy of the strategic plan to you from the fire district uh, as the fire district lays on. Uh, as you can see, we've recently updated that uh, strategic plan, mission, vision, guiding principles, as well as goals, creating matrixes around the goals to accomplish those. Uh, so that has been accomplished and we're moving forward <coughs> as the fire district. And then of course, uh, at the last board meeting, uh, as you're aware, the board um, elected uh, unanimously to move forward with the levy increase uh, in this May election. Uh, the letter, uh, and I won't cover that tonight in trying to, but I have asked the mayor to see if we could schedule a presentation by the uh, fire district to the city council in regards to a uh, full-fledged presentation on the, on the levy as we've done in the past. Today I did meet with the Chamber Legislative Committee and they endorsed the, the uh, Chamber Legislative Committee endorsed uh, the, uh, the levy as well. So we'll move forward with information back to the public as best we, as we possibly can in between now and the May election. So, end of my reports. Great. Thank you very much. We'll move into city administrator business and staff reports. Mayor, just one item, and that is um, this, this Monday, February 20th, is President's Day. Um, and uh, in <coughs> recognition of that, the city recognizes that as one of our official holidays as well. Our city offices will be closed that day, just to let you know and let the public know. Okay. That's all I've got this evening. That's it. Will our library be closed as well, or will the library? Uh, it's closed, yes. I have one thing to add, if you don't mind, um, which is um, the, the upcoming uh, planning commission meeting on the 27th will have 
some uh, my participation and, and Don Hardy's participation in doing a bit of training on the quasi-judicial process and such. So I had heard uh, that there was a, a hope that we could redo that. I know we've done it in the past, and um, I think it's been appreciated and, and helpful. So we're going to get on that again this uh, next upcoming Planning Commission meeting. That, yeah. Great. Final opportunity for citizen input. No one wishing to address. We'll move to action review. You've approved the consent agenda. Uh, approved staff to bring back resolution 1379 on March 15th with amended language to use SDCs and resolution 1380 and approve the Canby Depot Museum Local Register of Historic Resources application. Perfect. Thank you very much. Second. Um, actually, um, before we adjourn, um, I'm sorry. Uh, actually, we have an exec session scheduled for this evening, so um, I'll take a motion to move into exec session. Okay, I'm going to move into exact session. I'm looking it up as I talk. O R S 192.660. 192.660, uh, parent two, parent I, performance evaluation of a public officer. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, Aye. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, the council will move into exec session. Representatives of the news media and designated staff may attend executive sessions. Representatives of the news media are specifically directed not to report on any of the deliberations during the executive session, except to state the general subject of the session as previously announced. No executive session may be held for the purpose of taking final action or making any final decisions. So we will, if there is anything, well, we will come out of exec session and adjourn the meeting. Uh, when that concludes. So, Cami, we are going to say good night. Um, thank you all for coming. We will be back um, in the beginning of March, March 1st. Mr. Mayor, the, for our two council members that are on the Zoom link, there's a separate Zoom link for the executive session. Um, I think Maya is making comments. Okay, perfect. <laughs> and I think we've already sent that to Councillor Bang, so she should have that. Yeah, so just perfect. Perfect. Just got off work and. Mm -hmm.